Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lantzman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and welcome to this joint hearing with the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, chaired by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, on the efficacy of batterer intervention programs. In 2018, the New York Police Department recorded an 8% increase in reported domestic violence incidents, up to more than 250,000. <coughs> Since 2017, even while the city's homicide rate has fallen, the number of domestic violence-related killings has continued to go up. In a 2014 City Council hearing on batterer intervention programs, we wanted to better understand when a batterer's failure to attend or complete a court-mandated program led to a violation and DV-related recidivism. We heard concerns that programs may be limited in their ability to track success, that success was determined merely by the batterer's attendance and completion rate, and that failure might be determined only by recidivism. We also heard concerns that a false positive result, a batterer successfully completing a program, could put victims at risk of future harm because the program's metrics might not be capturing more meaningful changes or lack of changes in the batterer's behavior. A review of current literature reveals that questions around the efficacy of court-ordered batterer intervention programs remain a, hop, a topic of research and debate. Some consensus has formed around best practices, generally calling for a coordinated community response, including between the courts and treatment programs. But much of the debate from 2014 remains. New York City continues to fund some court-ordered intervention programs. The Power and Control, or PAC program, administered by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, offers court-mandated programming through the criminal and family courts in all five boroughs. In addition, the Office of the Manhattan District Attorney, in a program partnering with the Urban Resource Institute, began a court-mandated intervention program this past summer. There is also city funding available for batterer intervention work outside of court-mandated programs. A safe way forward with funding from the Administration for Children's Services includes two demonstration projects run by Safe Horizon in Staten Island and the Children's Aid Society in the Bronx. The Mayor's Domestic Violence Task Force and its Interrupting Violence at Home Initiative plans to provide programs for abusive partners who are not involved in the criminal justice system. NGBV administers a program through the Center for Court Innovation in which domestic violence coordinators in each borough will work with a voluntary, voluntary population of adult abusive partners. NGBV also has an open RFP for an abusive partner intervention program to work mostly with voluntarily engaged participants. For those programs that are already running, we want to better understand what successful outcomes look like. For those programs that are either so new that they can't report outcomes or are still in the planning stages, we want to better understand how they plan to measure their efforts. The urgency of the need for us to treat domestic violence as a serious threat to our families and communities requires the Council's continued vigilance. We look forward to hearing from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, our district attorney's offices, program providers, survivors of domestic violence, legal services providers, activists, advocacy groups, advocacy groups experts on the topic of domestic and gender-based violence, and any other stakeholders. And we look forward to continuing to develop frameworks for evaluating the programs on which so many New Yorkers' lives depend. With that, um, I would invite uh, the co-chair of this hearing, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, to deliver remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Lansman. It's an honor to chair this hearing with you. Thank you so much. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Uh, Thank you, Chair Lansman, for inviting my committee to join yours to hold this very important hearing. I also want to take a moment to honor that today is Transgender Day of Remembrance. Um, uh, 
Once again, we are talking about domestic violence. Domestic violence is a scourge that can affect anyone regardless of gender, socioeconomic status, or background, but it primarily affects women, women of color in particular, and members of the LGBTQ population. Yet as violent crime rates continue to drop across the five boroughs annually, the rates of domestic violence have remained pervasive. Last summer, my committee held an oversight hearing on domestic violence initiatives where we asked, are we meeting the need for domestic violence services in the city? And at that hearing, we heard from several advocates that emphasized the need for more programming and services for abusive partners. And so today we're discussing batter intervention programs or abusive partner intervention programs, which are intended to address the source of domestic violence. While such programs have existed for some time in some form or another for over 30 years, there's little proof that these programs actually put a stop to domestic violence and reforms are necessary. The goal of today's hearing is to better understand the landscape of better intervention programs in the city. We want to know what's changed since the four early model programs that were created by the city and whether new approaches are being implemented. It is essential that intervention programs work for diverse populations, including LGBTQ plus individuals that do not fall into the heteronormative or patriarchal paradigms. We look forward to hear about NGBV's efforts to engage with perpetrators of violence before they're caught up in the justice system. We're also interested in hearing about the justice system's approach to perpetrators and the effectiveness of court-mandated treatment programs. I'd like to thank Marisa Mock, my chief of staff, Madhuri Shukla, my new and amazing legislative director, and committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Jaisri Ganapathy, the Legislative Council, Chloe Rivera, the Senior Legislative Policy Analyst, and Monica Peppel, Financial Analyst. And finally, uh, I hope, oh, I'm so pleased to acknowledge my colleague, Councilmember Debbie Rose, who has been a, champ a fierce champion on Staten Island for uh, women in particular. Thank you very much. I turn it back to you, Chair. So I understand um, testifying from the administration this afternoon is the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. Am I correct? Good. So why don't we um, swear you in and then we can hear your testimony. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Um, have you decided amongst yourselves who would go first? Please proceed. Good morning, Chairpersons Rosenthal and Lansman, and members of the City Council Committees on Women and Gender Equity and Justice. I am Hannah Pennington, Assistant Commissioner of Policy and Training at the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, otherwise known as NGBV. I am pleased to be here today with our colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Mock J, and NGBV's Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel, Elizabeth Dank, to speak with you about batter intervention programs, which we refer to as Abusive Partner Intervention Programs, or APIPs. NGBV, which was relaunched and expanded in 2018 via Executive Order 36, develops policies and programs, provides training and prevention education, conducts research and evaluations, performs community outreach, and operates the New York City Family Justice Centers. We collaborate with city agencies and community stakeholders to ensure access to inclusive services for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, including intimate partner and family violence, elder abuse, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. NGBV works closely with the city's domestic violence advocates who for decades have worked tirelessly to increase supportive services for domestic violence survivors and their families. Today, New York City has the largest network of family justice centers in the country and a rich and vast network of local domestic violence service providers offering a range of crisis and supportive services for victims of domestic violence. 
while New York City has put significant resources into building a network of services and programs for domestic violence survivors and their children, in recent years, the city has increased its focus on interventions for abusive partners. We know, as many domestic violence advocates frequently report, that while most survivors want the abuse to stop, many do not want their partners to be arrested or incarcerated. Working with abusive partners or people who cause harm is a critical component in our efforts to interrupt violence between intimate partners, to support survivors, and to foster healthy relationships and communities. As such, improving New York City's capacity to provide effective services for abusive partners is essential in our overarching goal to reduce the pervasiveness of intimate partner violence. Recognizing this need to develop innovative and non-mandated program programming for abusive partners, the city announced the Interrupting Violence at Home initiative in 2018 to develop evidence and trauma-informed intervention models that address abusive behavior and to reduce future abuse in intimate partner relationships. The non-mandated community-based program for people causing harm in their relationships created through the Interrupting Violence at Home initiative is part of the city's commitment to the creation of innovative tools and strategies to end violence. NGBV worked closely with local experts, providers, advocates, and survivors to develop this initiative. In particular, the Coalition on Working with Abusive Partners, otherwise known as Co-op, and the Interagency Working Group on Abusive Partner Interventions, which included a research project by the Center for Corn Innovation and independent consultant Porvi Shaw, supported by Chapman Perlman Foundation. Under this initiative, the city will one, create respect and responsibility. The first city-funded community-based program for abusive partners who are not mandated to participate by the criminal justice system. Two, create respect first. The first city-funded trauma-informed and culturally competent accountability program for teens who have demonstrated unhealthy relationships with intimate partners and or family members. Three, in collaboration with MOCJ and the Office to Prevent Gun Violence, incorporate domestic violence coordinators in New York City crisis management system sites to enhance the identification and response to domestic violence in communities served by CMS. Four, develop a best practice guide for implementing restorative justice practices in community-based models to address domestic violence in New York City. And lastly, five, develop a specialized NGBV training curriculum to provide city agency staff and community-based organization skills to better identify and engage with abusive partners, including tools to understand risk factors and identify high levels of risk. In New York City, between 2010 and 2018, the NYPD had previous contact with the victim and the offender in only 40% of the intimate partner homicides. A key focus of the Interrupting Violence at Home program is creating a baseline of information regarding the identification, engagement, and intervention of abusive partners outside of the criminal justice system. This information is critical in order to continue to drive down domestic violence incidents and enhance accountability for abusive partners, as well as enhan enhance survivor safety. In addition to developing new programming outside of the criminal justice system, the city is also seeking to innovate programming within the criminal justice system and for families. MOCJ currently funds an APIP for criminal justice mandated participants and through the Domestic Violence Task Force funding, recently expanded that program to Staten Island and had and contracted with the Center for Court Innovation to develop trauma-informed curriculum to be used for the program following a new procurement process. In addition, in 2018, the Administration for Children's Services announced a three-year demonstration project called A Safe Way Forward, an innovative program that provides services to the entire family, including the person causing harm, which will include an APIP component. Prior to that, in 2017, the Department of Probation launched a new Queens Domestic Violence Program to provide specialized domestic violence programming and supervision practices responsive to individual client risks and needs. The Queen's program enhances offender accountability, including the provision of a new APIP modeled off the pre-existing successful APIP used by DOP in a Bronx program called Promoting Accountability and Community Ties, the PACT program. 
We are at a critical time in New York City as we move forward with innovating the design and delivery of abusive partner programs both within and outside of the criminal justice system and are eager to establish an evidence-based and design programming that is reflective of and tailored to the needs of abusive partners while prioritizing survivor safety. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with our city agency colleagues, our community partners, survivors, and other stakeholders to enhance abusive partner programming in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this issue, and we welcome any questions the committees may have. Good afternoon. Sorry, I got a new towel. <laughs> Make sure we're closer. Good afternoon, Chairpersons Lanceman and Rosenthal, and members of the Committee on Justice and Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My name is Deanna Logan, and I am the Deputy Director of our Crime Strategies Unit in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Joined here with me is Shakira Algren, who serves as one of our Senior Counsel. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the Mayor on criminal justice policy and is the Mayor's representative to the courts, district attorneys, defenders, and state criminal justice agencies, among others. Referred to as MockJ, MockJ designs, deploys, and evaluates citywide agencies, citywide strategies to increase safety, reduce unnecessary arrests and incarceration, improve fairness, and build the strong neighborhoods that ensure enduring public safety. While crime has fallen to historic lows in the city, domestic violence persists. Today, domestic violence accounts for 40% of assaults and 20% of homicides in the city. Additionally, the effect of domestic violence stresses well beyond the crime rate. It can lead to cross-generational continuation of violence, affect survivors and their families' financial security, and impacts the city's resources and service systems, including the shelter system. Addressing the impacts of domestic violence requires a holistic approach. At MockJ, we have worked with our partners in the district attorney's office to shape and fund resources such as a domestic violence complaint rooms that provide survivors appropriate space and privacy when sharing their experiences, and domestic violence units throughout the city that promote high quality incident responses. At the same time, we also know that expanding effective programming opportunities for people who come into contact with the justice system is a key strategy to continue lightening the touch of enforcement while simultaneously reducing overall crime in our city. It's for this reason and others that we believe that abusive partner intervention programs, or referred to as APIP, are essential to combating domestic violence in New York City. Currently, Mock J maintains a contract with Program for Power and Control, referred to as PAC, which is an APIP that is available in all five boroughs. It was originally in four boroughs, but the expansion of the Staten, into Staten Island was also afforded by the DB Task Force funding. PAC addresses domestic violence through educational programming rather than a sole focus on punishment. Its curriculum aims to address issues of abuse and coercion in relationships and is informed by the Duluth model curriculum, which is designed to teach new patterns of thought and behavior. Through the program, participants attend one hour of programming for 24 weeks. Now, as with all models of engagement that address how we change and give incentives for modifying behavior, time and experience shape what we know to be the most effective protocols. When thinking in about an APIP, we know that any model selected must be trauma-informed. Moreover, we also know that where once dominant theories about the role of financial payments and accountability 
have not necessarily proven effective over time. As such, MockJ is exploring the development of a fee-free model, models that are trauma-informed curriculums for both men and women whose involvement with the criminal justice system is related to domestic violence. This development is also being funded by resources from the DVTF task force. In addition, MockJ's work continues to advance and improve as we seek new and innovative approaches to address the intersection of domestic violence and gun violence. This will be aided by a grant that we received from the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Justices, or NCJFCSJ, and that was in April of this year. As part of this grant, Brooklyn was selected as one of six sites nationally to participate in the Firearms Technical Assistance Project, FTAP for short. The objective of this project, which has also been partnered with NGVB, is to improve public health and safety in Brownsville, Brooklyn, by helping the community implement policies, protocols, and promising practices to prevent people who abuse their partners from having unlawful access to firearms. As part of this project, a number of participants, including the Center for Court Innovation, International Association of Chiefs of Police, National Center on Protection Orders and Full Faith and Credit, and the National Domestic Violence and Firearms Resource Center shared their insights into strengths and challenges of civil protection orders and other criminal domestic violence processes related to the prevention of unlawful access to firearms. Following those conversations, a management team led by our office, along with the New York City Police Department, the Kings County District Attorney's Office, discussed ways to improve coordination among system partners. While many resources already exist, it became apparent that enhanced coordination coupled with new ways to incentivize the removal of guns from abusive partners can help curb the flow of firearms and reduce fatalities. As we continue this work, we look forward to disseminating information more widely about effective strategies and lessons learned, along with identified approaches to protect victims, children, and others while promoting victim autonomy and safeguarding due process rights. Adding to these initiatives, the Office to Prevent Gun Violence, which is housed within MockJ, contracts with CCI to offer intimate partner violence-related supports to the crisis management system sites citywide. Again, this funding is through the Interrupting Violence uh, and Home Initiatives that is part of the DV Task Force. This initiative is called Reimagining Social Intimacy Through Social Engagement, or RISE. Through RISE, there are seven staff that support the CMS sites, a supervisor, and six coordinators, each of which serve two to three CMS sites. The coordinators train CMS staff on intimate partner violence, educate the community about how to have safer and healthier relationships, and offer support to individuals causing harm in their relationships. The coordinators have already begun hosting community workshops and trainings for CMS staff, and are on track to gradually roll out trainings for all CMS providers serving our city. In addition to our affirmative programs, we also want to make sure the Council is aware of our NYC Crime Victim Services Finder, or the Finder, in accordance with Local Law 162. This resource serves as a centralized locator of city-funded crime victim service providers, bless you, and is available for victims, service providers, advocates, and others who are interested in learning more about available services in New York City. By offering a finder that is housed on MockJ's website and available on third-party websites that cater to crime victims in the city, we hope to raise awareness on the myriad of services offered throughout the city. 
Finder is also available through NYC Hope, the city's resource directory for domestic and gender-based violence, which connects New Yorkers with information and resources to help those experiencing dating, domestic, or gender-based violence. As we know, victims of domestic violence are often in need of other support services, ranging from job access, housing assistance, and more. Lawyers and other social service providers too benefit from the finder in being able to coordinate to serve their clients. For, the, for all of these reasons, we're proud of our work on Finder and since its launch have found it to be another critical tool in ensuring those who are impacted by crime, including domestic violence, are connected to the services that they need to heal and fill essential needs and start to repair the harm that has been caused to them. Thank you for the opportunity to testify again, and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, let me recognize that we've been joined by council members uh, Ayala, Ayala and Kalos. And Andy Cohen. And um, do either of your agencies maintain a list of all of the available and active court-ordered uh, batterer intervention programs operating in the five boroughs? We don't have a list on our website. It sounds like Mokche doesn't either of all of the programs. Um, we are working closely with all of the city agencies that have launched or are in the process of developing new APICs. See, we've been at a, a disadvantage in this hearing because we've been un unable, the council has been unable to get a list of all the programs that are operating. From there, we would try to identify the funding for those programs, how many individuals are served by those programs, the, the eligibility criteria for those programs, and any uh, analysis or, or data on how effective those programs are. And it's concerning that the city, represented by the two agencies that I would think would be most responsible for knowing what is going on in our courts when it comes to batter intervention programs or APIP or whatever whatever you, you want to call them and and you don't know. So yes, you look like you're ready to say something. Please. So, so I I know that our two agencies do not maintain a list of all of the programs that are, are available for the courts. However, it would seem that OCA would be a repository because their judges are the ones who know all of the programs available so that we could coordinate trying to obtain a list because OCA would be the repository of all the programs available to the jurists to order the defendants in cases before them to participate. Well. And, and look, I, I'm not saying this because I want to criticize you. There are other hearings for that on different issues. It's not this one, okay? It's true that OCA, as the Office of Court Administration, should also have that list. I don't know, part of this hearing is to find out um, whether or not uh, OCA requires or, or, or the judges are somehow required to choose programs from an approved list. That's one of our questions, um, or if each judge is able to do what he or she feels like. But in your, in Mach J's, your testimony, you did describe Mach J correctly as, I'm paraphrasing because I don't want to read it back to you, but as the office, the agency that advises the mayor and oversees the criminal justice system for the, for the city um, in, 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 in its many ways. So. Um, I would like if you, or you, one of you, or the you collectively, the royal you, would undertake to communicate with OCA, the district attorneys, 
the public defenders, and whomever else you regularly deal with, in many cases have contracts with, to get the council a comprehensive list of all the batter intervention programs, all the APIPs that are currently operating in the five boroughs. Would you endeavor to, to do that for us, perhaps, you know, by the end of the year? Yes. Thank you. Which are the programs, the court ordered, I'm, now I'm gonna focus mostly on the court ordered, court related programs and, and Council Member Rosenthal will focus on, on the others and you know, whatever else she wants to focus on, of course. So for the court ordered programs, do you, uh, excuse me, for the, for the city funded court ordered programs, how many of, of there are those? There is one, Council Member. Only one? Yes. That is the one. PAC? Yes. Okay. Um, how many, let's start with the PAC. What is the, the eligibility for someone to be able to, to, to participate in the PAC program? What, are there exclusions based on, on the seriousness of the, 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 the crime that they're charged with or their, their prior criminal record or, or any other exclusions? Um, the first primary uh, requirement is that they are being faced with a DV charge, domestic violence charge. Um, they are then screened by the, the clinical assessor. Nine times out of 10, they are eligible because they have the domestic violence charge. If they don't have an extensive list of prior domestic violence convictions, then they are eligible for the PAC program. Uh, it is my understanding that these are misdemeanor cases. These are not felony cases. Um, there will be other concerns because there are DV uh, felony courts in each borough. So those felony cases will be handled by that DV courtroom. How many um, participants have there been in the PAC program? Um, contractually, we have asked them to serve at least 450 citywide. We have asked for a tally at this particular time. We are still waiting for those numbers. We can provide those to you when we, when we receive them. Okay, and, and when did the PAC program formally kick off? Um, we, uh, the contract started in 2018. 2018? Yes. All right, but you don't have numbers yet for the number of participants from, from the start until today? We do not have those numbers at this particular time. We did request them. We are waiting to receive them. Okay, great, thank you. Um, prior to the PAC program, was there another city-funded batter intervention program? Not to my knowledge, council member. All right. Um, and so what is the process by which Mock J will evaluate whether or not the PAC program is, is effective, is working? My, under <coughs> Excuse me. My understanding is that um, one of the requirements is whether or not they have met the number of individuals we have asked them to service, um, whether or not there has been a high or low number of recidivists, um, whether or not they have been completed the program, um, and we would ask for, for them to provide that particular information to us for, for us to evaluate it. Um, we are also looking at um, whether or not the, du we are exploring whether or not the Duluth model is still applicable to um, abu abusive partner intervention programs at this time. So metrics of success or, or failure would be recidivism? That would be one, yes. So after the completion of the program or during their participation in the program, whether or not they, uh, uh, is it, is it, whether or not they commit another DV-related offense or any, fa or any it would, offense? It would be DV-related. DV-related. Yes. And in what time frame? Is it six, within 60 days of completion of the program, two years, or something else? Um, with PAC, it is a 90-day, a uh, after 90 days of completion, they do a web crims query to see if the individual has been rearrested. Okay. And then um, completion of the program, is this, this the one that's a 26-week? It is 24 weeks. 24 weeks. Yes. Okay. Um, do you have any data on completion rates or, or recidivism rates yet? Not at this time. We asked for everything from the beginning, so we are okay. waiting for that information. In the contract with um, the PAC program, are they required to affirmatively report these metrics to Mock J on, on some kind of periodic basis, or is it a matter of Mock J asking the PAC program, hey, how are you doing? Um, I believe they may be required to report, but I asked for all new metrics. 
So to be prepared for this, for this hearing, unfortunately, I have not received them yet. But when I do get them, I will be more than happy to turn okay. them over. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an assumption, which is you know, sometimes uh, hazardous, that because Mach J doesn't have this data, even though the program has been operating for more than a year, I'm going to assume that there's no affirmative requirement on the part of the PAC program to send Mach J performance metrics without waiting for Mach J to, 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 to ask for them. Other, otherwise, you'd have them. Like, oh, okay, let's just go back. We've got our, we've got our, six, our, 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 our quarterly report from the PAC program. Well, I, we do have deliverables that they are required to send to us. I have not received them yet. I did request them. Right. And so I'm simply waiting for, we, we went all the way back to the beginning. And so I asked them to compile all of the information for us. So it is my understanding that they do, and they are required to provide deliverables to us. I'm just simply waiting for that to be provided to me so I can turn it over. Okay, well not, not, not to beat a dead horse, but, but I just so we understand the distinction. I, I wanna make sure that the PAC program and whatever other future programs might be funded by the, by the city, that there is within their contract an understanding of what the metrics of success are and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about, about what appropriate metrics of success are, um, but also that they have an affirmative responsibility on some reasonable basis, whether it's quarterly or yearly, or whatever is industry professional practice, to provide them to Mach J and not, you know, whenever Mach J feels it needs that information to go and ask for it. Understood. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So okay. can you let us know what the contract does require yeah. of good. Um, we're going to hear testimony later today, I'm sure, that measuring success is much more uh, nuanced and should be more uh, comprehensive than merely measuring whether a person completed a program and whether or not they recidivated within a certain period of time. And I was wondering if, if either Mach J or um, uh, the Mayor's Office to End Gender-Based Violence um, has anything to, to, to add or, or discuss about what is, here in 2019 with all the literature and research that's been done, what is the appropriate way to evaluate whether a, a, a better intervention program or an APIP um, is successful? And what can we do to incorporate those things into, into contracts? So the programs that we discussed in our testimony, as I mentioned, are non-mandated programs. Um, and we have, um, particularly with respect to respect and responsibility, which there, that is actually, there's a live solicitation for that program. We are proceeding as a demonstration project so that we can use our implementation process and the formative evaluation that's attached to it to look at exactly what you're talking about to determine, um, you know, knowing there is a body, as you mentioned, of literature that for many years has looked at the success of these programs. Um, and there is many programs use lots of different components um, and don't necessarily strictly follow one particular uh, protocol. So what we want to do is actually use this process to look beyond, I mean, in our cases, in our program, it's not gonna be connected to the criminal justice system, so re, you know, re-arrest is not going to be um, pertinent to those case, to that, to that program, um, but we, we still want to be very intentional and deliberate about looking at what could be, and there are programs around the country um, that have looked at other measures of success, such as survivor safety, such, such as, access to services, completion of services. Um, and we want to make sure that we're looking at that whole suite of options as we, as we look at the development of our program in the non-mandated context. Sorry. The, um, the, the contract with the uh, PAC program, how, how long is it? Um, it will actually end um, in, on June 30th of 2020. Of 2020, so it's yes. coming up. Yes. So um, is there a, an RFP 
to, to renew it? Is that subject to what happens in this coming budget negotiations? Um, um, at this time, we're exploring other options. There have not been any decisions made yet. Okay. What do you mean by other options? Um, well, because the Duluth model seems to be um, somewhat outdated, so mm. Mock J has started exploring more trauma-informed programming, and that does lead to maybe uh, the development of a new curriculum, so we are also exploring that. We're also exploring looking at um, providing uh, programming for women as well. So at this particular time, w there's a large field out there that we are looking at and hope to make some decisions very soon. So Mach J will be back here um, in March for a budget hearing. You'll probably be back a few times before then for other things. Um, make a note, please. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask you about where you are in the process of thinking about and preparing for the end of this program on June 20th and going forward, uh, in June 2020, rather, and going forward what is going to replace it? And um, I would hope that at that time, when we're in March, not November, there will be a, a more fully developed plan and, and thoughts on what the next generation, if you will, of batter intervention programs or APIPs or whatever you want to call it, um, what they're going to what they're going to look like. And I'm hopeful that it will incorporate some of the things that we are, are talking about here including what is the most up-to-date thinking on what makes these programs work, um, as well as building into the contract with, with whomever for whatever, very regular um, uh, reporting of performance metrics. Yes. With yes. that, in the absence of us having a list of all the programs that are out there, I feel constrained to, to, to really uh, ask you any more questions about about the court ordered um, uh, batter intervention programs were somewhat like I said in the beginning uh, hamstrung by that uh, but I do appreciate your commitment to by the end of this year using your vast resources and talents to get that information from all the stakeholders and actors in the criminal justice system with whom you you regularly uh, interact um, I may have more questions later, but now I want to uh, give uh, my co-chair, Councilmember Rosenthal, the opportunity to, to ask her questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Lansman. And frankly, I'd like to follow the exact same line of questioning um, with NGBV. I mean, I think this is the heart of the problem, whether it's a court-ordered program or a prevention program, do we have any academic research, any, are you working with any thought institutions like FIRA or another one to identify what a successful intervention program would look like um, if we look around the country at what other cities and municipalities are doing, is there a best practices is anyone really doing any, any cutting edge research on this? So thank you for the question. Um, this, and there's a lot to be said for the work that we've done to engage with our stakeholders, but also researchers and to look ourselves at the programs that you're mentioning from across the country. And that work began um, in earnest, I would say, back in 2015 when we had a policy roundtable on this issue. Um, and we did that with the Coalition on Working with Abusive Partners, which is an organization that's been around for a long time and that was created specifically to bring together advocates who work with survivors who n knew, to um, Councilmember Lansman's point, that there were programs on the ground doing this work and they wanted to bring together practitioners and advocates and survivors to think about best practices for these kinds of programs. Um, with co-op, we put on that policy roundtable. There was stakeholders at that meeting, at, at that convening, who then um, together formed what we call the Interagency Working Group on Abusive Partner Intervention. And through that group, we, NGBV, um, contracted with CCI and a consultant named Porvi Shaw, 
and that CCI and the consultant worked with our group of stakeholders for over a year, um, and that stakeholder group included city agencies, it included district attorneys, it included survivors, it included um, community-based organizations, and the consultant conducted um, comprehensive research using interviews and group um, focus groups with survivors, people who cause harm, criminal justice um, providers, uh, social service providers, I could go on and on. Um, and that body of research resulted in a report called Seeding Generations. And that report did undertake an effort Sorry, to- Sorry, could you say it one, just slowly? Sure. Seeding, Seeding Generations. Oh, got it, thank you. Yeah. Um, and one of the, um, and it's a comprehensive report, but one of the, one of the um, key pieces of our work with the consultant was to identify best practices in what these programs could look like and haven't always looked like. And those are exactly the elements that we are looking to as we implement our programming, which is still in the planning phase, but we are using that and other research to inform our demonstration project. And I mentioned some of them already, but we want to, um, you know, we, are, we know that there are promising practices that we can be, be looking to, like using trauma-informed practices, um, you know, working, uh, centering survivors, but also, you know, on both the abuse partner front and the victim front, knowing that we need to use risk assessment tools and individualized differential assessments so that we aren't using a one-size-fits-all model, that we are actually creating an intervention and we are, we are innovative in doing it. We want, to create an, we want to look at the intervention as we're creating it to see that we are creating an intervention that actually um, is effective and that is responsive to the needs of abuse partners. I hear the words you're saying mm -hmm. and I understand them and they're definitely the words that are being used. It's the the language yeah. of the advocacy community um, in many different areas that we discuss um, with NGBV and in our hearings. I am um, interested to know that they are, that the vocabulary is so recent, um, you know, and that I, I hear that you're You've worked with the advocates using the information from the advocates' life experiences. Um, you're coming up with a model that is a model that makes sense using the language that we all use now, trauma-informed risk assessments. But I'm surprised to learn, I guess disappointed to learn, there's no CUNY academic who is researching this topic. There's no one at John Jay um, who is researching best practices. I mean, is it really, I, I mean, I'm impressed, but surprised, you know, is it really CCI and their consultant who is doing the cutting edge research that has never been done in any other municipality so that really today we are on the cutting edge waiting to find out what works and what doesn't using this new model. I appreciate the question. Um, I think that we can't speak to all the research that is, is in the works or happening, but I think the way we are viewing this initiative and all the components of interrupting violence at home is that there is an opportunity to build an evidence base of best practices, and that's what we're trying to do through using a demonstration project. Yeah, no, I appreciate everything that's being done now, but you know, if I go back to, um, I, I'm just connecting this to a lot of the work that uh, I've been doing around the NYPD and the Special Victims Division, that uses very similar language. I mean, these are these are terms, these are approaches that you know were thought about ten years ago in a department of investigation when Department of Investigation began their research. I mean, this is. I guess what I'm trying to say is that none of this is new, and I'm not saying it's you at all. It's just 
sort of mind boggling that, um, you know, that society, New York City government, society advocates have just woken up and said, gee, none of the programs work. Domestic violence is something that's been happening for so long. We've been struggling with it so long. It's been such an obvious pattern over the last, um, since, since the beginning of this administration, as homicides have gone down, domestic violence, homicides have remained flat. Um, you know, when we say that the number of incidents, DV incidents have increased, um, the DV assaults, you know, of course we all have to wonder, is that because reporting has gone up or because assaults have gone up? And I think quite obviously we all know the answer is because reporting has gone up. So I'm just a little baffled to understand that, you know, that we're not farther along. And frankly, in, in response to the exchange with Councilmember Lanceman, it sounds like these very fundamental questions that he's asking are being asked now because we are holding this hearing, which of course is irrelevant to the work the city does every day to address the needs of New Yorkers. Um, so I would hope that it's not because of our oversight hearing that people are thinking of these questions, and I'm asking that in the most respectful way, but am I just to walk away disheartened? Sorry. I'll, I'll ask more peppy questions in That's a minute, okay. but I'm just trying to get to the cut to the chase here. Okay. I think I would say in response to that, that I hope that you would um, be hopeful as we are, because this is a critical time in our enhancement and addition to our holistic response in how we intervene and work to prevent domestic and gender-based violence. And I actually think this is a critical time that and I think that the work that I spoke to that's been happening over the last, during this administration, um, represents a shift um, and a willingness to innovate and a willingness to look at different models and a willingness to work to create a new evidence base um, and actually to identify gaps that existed because we haven't talked about non-mandated non community-based programs. Um, it was, probably the top priority of the stakeholders that we met with for several years to work to develop that kind of program. Um, and it's a new kind of program that it doesn't exist. It's something survivors have asked for. And because it's new, we need to be deliberate about looking at, you know, what kind of adventure intervention in that new space, how that will be effective. And we know that many families are not engaging with the criminal justice system, so we, we want to be very intentional about trying to fill that gap. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, in your testimony, or I forget if it was Mark Jay's, 40% of assaults, um, no, it wasn't that one. It was one where uh, the number of people that had had a connection with the police prior to something horrible happening um, is de minimis. And so I think it all rests on prevention programs. I mean, what I don't understand, and again, I appreciate the, the notion of trauma-informed and, and, and working with the advocates to develop the tools, but it's really hard to understand um, whether or not, how do I know whether or not you're, the city is spending enough money to address this problem? You know, are these programs, let's even, you know, I, I respect the advocates, I've worked with the advocates as well, so let's assume that the criteria that you've designed, the, the, the markers that you've determined are the right markers to define success are right, I mean, given the nature of the fact that, 
you know, homicides have come down and domestic violence homicides have remained flat and the number of assaults has increased, why aren't we, why isn't this the most important issue that everyone's been focused on over the last six years? Why aren't we tripling the effort, quadrupling the effort? I mean, my guess would be, I'm just totally making this up, but that the new RFP, the new program you've come up with Center of Coordinated Innovation is spectacular. So why aren't we, roll, I mean, the demand is so high. In the last two months, we saw two domestic violence homicides that otherwise no one knew about. And in their commu respective communities, I think they were quite aware of what was going on, but don't have the tools to address the issues. So I don't, I would like the city to, whatever it's spending, you know, times 10, no? I mean, don't we, we're confident that what you've come up with is a great program, I think. Aha, it's not on. Uh, it's, it, it is, I don't want you to be disheartened first and foremost. Part of this issue is looking at, you want us to come with solutions. And one of the things that we're working on innovatively are what are those solutions supposed to be? And the FTAP project is really focusing on that. So on Monday, we started the site launch for that project. And that project is a project that is going to the community because what makes survivors feel safe and what is going to get them to a safe place and get our communities to a safe place where we can be addressing the, the domestic violence is going to come for community. And yes, there's development of programs, but ultimately you need the buy-in from the people that those programs are going to serve. And so part of that initiative is taking law enforcement who has been thwarted or not as effective as they want to be in addressing this issue because the communication, the coordination with the people that they are serving is not there. And thus this project is to determine how we create process and protocol to make that more effective and to have more success. In that particular project, we will be focusing on Brownsville Victor and Brownsville Brooklyn, we're working with the Brooklyn DA's office, we're working with the CBOs in the 73rd precinct to define and figure out what the solutions are for how we coordinate the services that exist, how we are able to get guns out of households so that we are not seeing more domestic violence homicides, so that we are providing and communicating and working together all of the agencies that have been putting all of the resources to trying to combat this problem to be more effective and successful. No, and I, as I say, I appreciate it. You're using all the words that I've heard, all the vocabulary that I've heard from the advocates as well. Of course, it has to be appropriate from the community. Of course, it has to bubble up from the community. There has to be um, buy-in. I'm just perplexed. Um, why it's taking so long, and I'm perplexed why we're not spending a lot more money. The round table was in 2015, we're at the end of 2019. So how much money are we spending on this? For, I mean, also to the council member's point, we don't have a list of all the predator intervention programs, some are maybe city funded, maybe some are just faith-based and, and not city-funded, but how much money does NGBV think is being invested in intervention programs right now, or how much, mm -hmm. how much was the, sorry to not use the right words here, but the most recent contract, how much did we, are we putting out for that one? So we can speak to Interrupting Violence at Home, the initiative under us. Um, so we had 350 added in FY19. $350,000? In FY19 for development purposes. And then 2.2 million was added in FY20 and 1.9 million added in FY21 in the out years. So why isn't it 5 million? So to address that question, um, so there's two things really. One is that 
the intervention that we're creating, while yes, the kind of buzzwords that you're talking about have existed for some time, um, it is new for, the, for New York City and, and for most municipalities to be investing funding in this type of innovative model, especially outside of the criminal justice system. So we're taking time during the demonstration project to really build and test out a unique and innovative approach to working with abusive partners outside of the criminal justice system. But we also acknowledge that we have a knowledge gap about who are the individuals outside of the criminal justice system that we're hoping will come to and engage in our program. And so we're really using that time to be able to identify what the demand is, and then after the de demonstration project, be able to then move forward to address those concerns or issues. I hear you, but my guess is that we're gonna hear testimony from advocates after this who know the answers to those questions and would be ready to implement stuff today. Um, I, you know, I, so I would urge the, urge the administration, and this is going to be a question at budget time, um, as to why we're not spending more. Um, the trauma-informed, which uh, is a term of art, does that, uh, are those programs going to be wraparound services, or what does that mean? Are they going to involve the faith-based institutions? So as, um, uh, as our solicitation makes clear, um, we are expecting the providers and any of the providers who would be successful would need to include um, case management as well as connection to services for the person causing harm, um, which is an innovative element of a program. Um, again, we would um, include those providers, expect those providers and demand that those providers use individualized assessments to make sure that we are are meeting the person who's coming through the program where they are. Um, we also, you know, will be exploring um, what the victim engagement will look like in each of those um, programs as well. But the, we, are, we are expecting um, the providers to be developing programs that, at, you know, Again, we're building a base of evidence, but we also know promising practices and best practices, and we are expecting that those back best practices be integrated into the pr programs that come online. Um, I'm gonna ask one quick question, then I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Rose, but um, what are, do you have any, have you asked, in the two most recent homicides, uh, what I've heard from the South Asian community is, we have to get into the mosques. We have to be talking to the men. Someone from that world themselves, it can't be us, it can't be the women. So are you developing any programs for, do you, are you expecting that you or I will work with faith-based faith -based institutions to develop programs there? So the providers for our program for respect and responsibility haven't been identified yet, so it's not you or I, which- I understand. Okay. Who, oh, sorry, whoever it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm in response, are you asking them to work with faith-based institutions for them, for, for them to come up with their own solutions for dealing with this? Given that we're talking about meet people where they are, mm -hmm. trauma-informed, you know, getting in, having it be, you know, grassroots coming up from yes. the community. Yes, and it's a good question, and I think that the way that we've designed it and the way we are envisioning it is it will be in community, which is really critical, and that there will be referral sources that we'll be identifying that will include most certainly faith-based organizations, many of which our outreach team and other community-based or, um, organizations outreach teams are connecting with, and also we need to be, as we are um, already, doing outreach, doing training in community because we need to that, that's part of it, that's part of this coordinated response so that people know that the program, program exists, but also so that we know that we're helping people to um, enhance how they engage with not only people who um, are survivors of gender-based violence, but those who are causing the harm. And that's why there's another component of interrupting violence at home where our internal training team will be going out into communities and working with city agencies. And that is a, that is a shift. I think most of the time until now, 
the kinds of training that are happening in community often are understandably about understanding gender-based violence and, uh, and working diligently to connect survivors and their families to programs and services. But we want to, we want to build out that holistic approach and make sure that faith-based leaders, other community members um, have the tools they need to engage with the person who they see is causing harm. And so is NGBV, do you have partners who are in those mosques now? Yes, I mean, we have an outreach team that works throughout the city. We have no, no, specifically on those two homicide cases. Do you have outreach yeah. team in the mosques in those communities where those individuals lived? As we often do after these kinds of incidents, we are working on outreach strategies. Our outreach team does have connections in those communities. I can't tell you for sure whether you know, I can get back to you on that, whether those particular mosques, but we do, and we work closely with the Center for Faith and Community Partnerships to identify relationships all the time. I can't say specifically, but I know that we are actively engaging with that community. Yeah, I think I'd like a better answer. I, I think that the public demands a better answer. I think that NGBV should be prepared to say, we've identified the mosques, We've identified the communities, and we're in there now, and here's exactly what we're doing. And I think the public deserves that. This is, has been horrifying um, for everyone. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember Rose. Thank you, Councilmember um, Rosenthal, and um, I, I wanna thank you so much for your commitment to uh, the issue of domestic violence uh, she's been a, a very vocal advocate um, and I know stalwart in terms of making sure that uh, victims are um, positively um, interacted with and, and that there are tangible results. Um, with um, the BIP's pro BIP programs, um, how can we adapt them to race, gender, so sexual orientation, gender identity of the people who are involved in the domestic abuse? And how can we kind of change these intervention models to be less heteronormative um, in terms of their, you know, their focus? Yes, we, um, again, with respect to the programs that NGBV, I'll defer to Mock J with respect to the existing program funded by the city that's connected with the criminal justice system. But for the programs that we're developing through Interrupting Violence at Home, we are certainly aware of that gap in programming and services. And again, are expecting that the providers who will be um, bringing this programming online will be working diligently to address that exact issue, that this programming be accessible and relevant for the LGBTQ population, as well as other marginalized populations, um, and in general want to make sure that these programs address the whole range of accessibility issues that are in play. And um, are there any providers on Staten Island, and how many, um, and, and what exactly is their interaction with the uh, the DA's office in determining, you know, how these cases are um, are determined. So, um, for interrupting violence at home, our programs aren't online yet, but we can defer to Mac J. They have the PAC program on Staten Island, which was expanded there recently. Um, good afternoon, Council Member. Um, PAC afternoon. is on Staten Island. We actually received an allocation from the Domestic Violence Task Force of $200,000 to expand it to Staten Island. My understanding of the process is that the court liaison does speak with the, the assigned district attorney that is in the part and also with the domestic violence unit to make sure that that case is appropriate before the offer is actually made. Nine times out of ten, the judge is also um, uh, that is also discussed with the judge before the offer uh, before the offer is made to the defendant. So there are all of the court stakeholders are involved prior to that offer actually being made. So um, when does uh, BIP become an option or recommended to the person that's charged? 
That depends on the judge, um, council member. That does depend on the judge, and that does depend on, in reference to the individual's record, their past experience with domestic violence cases um, before that offer is actually made. That's why it's actually evaluated prior to the offer being made. Is there some type of criteria that will determine whether um, they receive, uh, they get put in a long-term or a short-term program? Are there, are both options available to people who are going through um, the criminal justice system on Staten Island? And um, yeah. Um, at this time, I can only speak to the program that Mock J funds. Um, PAC is a 24-week program. There is a um, one hour a week um, attendance that is required. They are required to complete the program successfully, or they are not released out of the conditions by the particular judge that is hearing that case. Um, I'm not sure about other uh, programs that are available that are shorter. My understanding, the program that we support is 24 weeks. And um, is there, uh, are these mandated, is that att attendance mandated and, um, and followed up? And is there some sort of um, oversight to make sure that the, the person is actually going to this program and successfully completes it? There is a requirement that the court must be notified of every attendance or every absence. If there is an absence, the judge can then make a decision as to whether or not to allow the defendant to go back into the program or if there are going to be other um, options exercised. But the court is always aware of when the defendant attends or does not attend. That nor that, and that uh, update normally happens frequently with the court dates. And um, is there any data in terms of recidivism and uh, based on whether or not they they continue the program, they don't continue the program, or just in general, what, what are the, um, the recidivism rates? I do not have those numbers at this time, but I will be providing those at a later date. Okay, you know, Staten Island gets left out an awful lot. I do understand. Um, proportionally, uh, when you look at our DV numbers, um, we are ranking, we're up there in, in DV, cases, and um, I, I think, I, I don't think, I want you to look at Staten Island in terms of effective programming for um, the victims of domestic violence. Yes, we will do that. Yes, and um, Council Member, I appreciate um, your concern. We, um, I just wanted to mention that the ACS program that I mentioned in my testi testimony, A Safe Way Forward, that ACS developed and launched uh, late last year and is online now is in two sites, one of which is in Staten Island, and the contractor provider Safe Horizon is, uh, is seeing clients through that program, and it is a, a new, a completely new approach for ACS where they are working with the entire family, and they have included in that model programs and services for the person causing harm, and it will include a, a group program, an APIP. It's not a criminal justice program, but I wanted to make sure that I, I mentioned that to you. A concern of mine um, about all services that are provided citywide, but um, primarily in Staten Island, is that they're not culturally competent. And um, and that to me has is a big determinant on whether or not people um, remain in these programs, if they even seek these programs, if they if they become recipients of any of the benefits that um, the few that are out there. So, what are we doing to make sure that these programs are culturally competent and they meet? My, con um, my constituents where they are and what their needs are. Thank you for that as well. And as we develop the programs within Interrupting Violence Home, particularly Respect and Responsibility, which is a program for adult people causing harm that's in community and non-mandated, as well as the program that will, be that will come online called Respect First for Young People. Um, we are very much expecting that the providers who implement those programs are tailoring their curricula and their programming um, to meet the needs of all populations, but particularly- But I don't want you to be hopeful that they're tailoring it because I have seen where, <laughs> we can be as hopeful as we want, <laughs> the disparities 
re remain and they're there and they're real. And I, I, I wanted to be more than hopeful. Yes. I needed to be mandated. I needed to be followed up. I needed to be regulated if, if, if that's you know what it takes because it is not the reality of the programs and they are not culturally competent and they don't meet my constituents mm -hmm. where they're at. And I misspoke. I'm not just being hopeful. It is included in what will be required of the providers to successfully b bid on these programs. And it will be a very important part of the oversight we will have in, in once the programs are online. Is there some way that you could share with me when, you know, these providers are, um, when they express an interest and before you make your your decisions about, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that you, you do an RFP, yes. right? Is there some way that, I would just like to be sure that it's very clear to my service providers what we're asking for. And that if they don't meet that criteria, that they are not given that contract. Mm -hmm. The procurement process um, doesn't allow that, but we have made it clear in the solicitation, which is publicly available now, that that is a requirement. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna follow up with you because um, this is really an important issue, um, you know, in my, dis in my district. Yeah. And I need for it to be reflective of of the very people who are being asked to, to utilize these services. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barry. Thank you so much. I mean, I think, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Cohen, but I, I appreciate the Councilmember raising these issues. I think it's part of the answer that we're all looking for. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs Lansman and Rosenthal. Uh, I, I have to say, you know, th this is another topic where uh, I come into this hearing with uh, very little knowledge, but I have to say that the, 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 the discussion here, I think, is of uh, some concern. Uh, maybe, though, you could uh, give some reassuring words. Could you give me some confidence that, I mean, you know, every day in New York, unfortunately, there are episodes of domestic violence of like what we feel good about, like that we have a response to certain scenarios that we think works really well, where if uh, a person is uh, goes into this program where there is a high likelihood uh, that they will they will uh, that this behavior will not continue, like th that there are, there has to be some bright spots here where you can say definitively we know this works and we're trying to expand that versus we're looking at this and we're looking at that. I mean, this is obviously not a new problem. And uh, I'd like to feel like that we have, you know, that we we have identified strategies that do work, that we're not inventing the wheel or starting from scratch on the, on this whole front. Could you talk about some of the things that where we where we where we have success? Thank you for the question. Um, I do um, I understand where you're coming from. It is a pervasive problem. That's why we we um, as a city are committed to creating and, and developing innovative strategies. And I think that we have made an unprecedented investment in this administration, particularly through the Domestic Violence Task Force to create new programming. We have we do have the largest network of family justice centers in the country and those, those programs, the program that, that survivors and their families have access through those centers and community-based organizations in community um, do pro provide a wealth of, of services and programs for survivors. And we are also, um, you know, very- Just to pin you down, you, yes. you think that in terms of victim services that we are doing a good job of delivering, sir? Yes, there, absolutely. We are, are looking all the time at ways to enhance that. Um, and we have, you know, added we add elements to those services and programs and have over time. And in this administration, we've added new elements as well, including new immigration services, one example. Um, we are in the process of creating new supervised visitation programming. Um, 
We've also put a lot of effort into prevention efforts because we know that that, you know, that working with young people and actually shifting cultural norms on this issue is critical. Um, and as I had mentioned before, this important abuse partner intervention work is one component of a really much larger holistic approach that includes both intervention and prevention strategies in the area of gender-based violence. Uh, okay, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, thank you for Just a, a couple more questions. I wanted to clarify. Um, the program, and this can apply to, to both court-mandated programs and, and, and others. Um, we're going to hear from uh, some of the advocates and public defenders later uh, talking about the costs of these programs, starting with the, the court-mandated programs. Um, what does it cost a participant? Um, are people allowed to participate and avail themselves of this program if they can't afford to pay that, that, that cost? Um, yeah. Um, the initial assessment fee is $50. Every session is $25. There is a sliding scale. Um, each individual, they have a financial assessment, um, and so that fee is adjusted according to their income. Um, there are also scholarships that have been made available to participants as well. So they are not able to pay. Um, my understanding is that the particular judge in that court part can uh, either uh, will assist them in finding some other program that may be cheaper or that may be free. It is our understanding that there are very few programs that are free at this particular time, but PAC does work as best as they can to make it affordable. For do, you know, do you know if anyone has been unable to participate because they can't afford whatever the final determination of their fee is? Not to my knowledge, council member. All right. We might hear differently later. That's a possibility. So let's pay attention to that. Yes. Um, in the, the non-court For the, programs? all of the programs within Interrupting Violence at Home will, will not have any fees attached. Why can't we have that in the court-mandated programs? That is an option that we are exploring as well. Yeah. That seems like a barrier that we would want to get, get rid of. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you're going, we're going to hear, I know, of concerns about uh, uh, language access that there aren't enough programs, or, or in some cases, any programs in, in some of the, the languages that we see in our in our city and in, in our court system in in, in, protect, in particular. Um, are there any are any of these programs in a language other than, than English? Um, PAC also has a Spanish speaking um, facilitator for the program as well. Okay, <clears throat> but if someone speaks uh, uh, Mandarin or Uzbek or any other 195 languages that are if we encounter New York City, kind of, they're out of luck? Well, it is my understanding that the, uh, the DV resource coordinators in the courtroom will then seek out a program, a private program, that um, is appropriate for that particular client's language. Mm. And as we are developing these programs, as I mentioned, in language access, access is a big part of the accessibility. Questions we'll be looking at as we bring them online. It um, indicates in our solicitation, which is out right now, that we're seeking proposals for programming um, that's accessible to um, participants who have limited English proficiency. Okay. Do you have anything else yeah, you want to I say? Do. Um, I'm just, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm just curious, a couple of things. Um, AVP has a pilot program called Transform that you're familiar with and it was funded by an outside group, not by the city. A uh, 15-week program, five individuals went through it. Apparently, it was tremendously successful, and they're recommending it to other organizations. Is that something the city would consider funding? Um, we can't speak to whether or not we would consider funding it yet, but we're excited to continue to discuss the success of the program with AVP and explore that further. It's the first program I've heard about that where somebody's talking about success. So I don't understand why it's not part of why you're not more enthusiastic. Oh, we are excited about it. Um, we will definitely talk to them more about it. Um, but, but why wouldn't this commit. be something where you would immediately, um, I mean, you're really constrained by having to put out an RFP and, and it would take forever. 
I mean, why not jump on something? You have a program in front of us that's successful. Is it part of the program that you've put out an RFP for? I'm sorry, what, what do you mean is it part of our program? Um, so, so how are you pursuing it? Pursuing this program or supporting it for the city to support it? How are we pursuing the city supporting it? Yeah, just given that it's not funded by the city, it was successful, so are we following their lead? Do we, have we analyzed the component parts of what made that successful? Jessica, um, you know, maybe Siri. reporting, you know, data, anything? Yeah, so from what we understand, they just completed their first session, so we're gonna be um, looking into it more and exploring um, the success of that program with AVP. We're excited to learn more about the success they've had um, and looking more into the program components with them. Um, I'm going back and looking at the Center for Court Innovation report, Seeding Generations, and one of their recommendations is to expand the RAP program in schools. Has the city done that, expanded funding for that? Do you know from what to what? Yes. We, um, through the Domestic Violence Task Force, we expanded RAP into five new um, high schools, um, and we also launched early RAP, which RAP is the Relationship Abuse Prevention Program, um, into middle schools very specifically wanting to address the high needs of those schools. And that program is in online in over 100 middle schools and will be in 128 middle schools by the end of the school year. So could you do a one-pager on that, sort of what it was in two th funding and the program in 2014 through today? Absolutely. Um, Okay, um, let me ask uh, specifically for NGBV, are you the oversight group for all of the different activities um, that are happening around this issue through MockJ, um, even through OCA, just to be aware of it, through the ACS um, work that they're doing uh, the work the DAs are doing, is it your responsibility to be o an oversight for all, coordinating all of those efforts? So we do not have oversight authority, but I will say that following the release of the report you just mentioned, Seeding Generations, uh, we began to convene quarterly meetings with the city agencies, their contracted providers, um, as well as consultants that are bringing these programs online. Um, so that we can convene the folks who are literally in the weeds right now and learn from each other, identifying best practices, talking about the efficacy measures we talked about earlier. Um, and that began at the beginning of 2019. And we will- Two th It began this year? When those programs began, in none of the programs that I mentioned had been online until the beginning of this year. Um, that's when we began those meetings to make sure that we're coming together um, as a group and that we and that includes all of the city agencies that I mentioned in my testimony um, and probably others I'd have to look to double check um, in the specialized training curriculum that you're coming up with which agencies will receive the training so the the training program that's part of interrupting violence at home um, it will you know, it will be conducted and facilitated by the NGBV training team that works closely with dozens of city agencies. And we will, we always do prioritize our city agency partners that we think probably need our training the most, but we will, we're, we're open to any city agency. We do a ton of work with the Department of Homeless Services. Um, we do a lot of work with um, the fire department. I mean, there's, a, a number of agencies that right. we're doing so the training you know, with. So this will be an additional offering. We already do do training with those city agencies and we're, we'll add it to our suite of options for folks who are looking to get trained. Okay, so how many staff could be getting the training across all the agencies, all the different staff titles? So I would have to get back to you with that kind of analysis, right. but I can tell you that the, the training team that 
launched um, at the end of 2016, we have already trained over 20,000 people, many of them city agency staff members, and some of them not city agency, not actual city employees, but people who are working under city contracts. How could we get to whether or not, how could we understand whether or not um, NGBB is meeting demand? In other words, uh, could you use twice the training staff to get to people faster? We really rely on the city agencies um, to um, help to identify their training needs. Um, currently, we're meeting the demand that's being presented to us and always exploring ways to enhance the partnerships we have with agencies to train their staff. Sounds like, though, you're you're, you have a new initiative, right, of training, and I'm just trying to get a sense of whether or not you have um, enough staff to meet what will, I mean, if you've already trained 20,000, let's assume 20,000 need this new training. Mm -hmm. So do you have staff available to train 20,000 people in this really important curriculum? We're also exploring right now um, ways to utilize technology to expand our training offerings, um, looking at webinars and other um, you know, such um, offerings so that we can reach larger audiences um, and create a wider impact with our training initiatives. Um, the RFP you mentioned before, uh, the, not the annual, the annual expenditure will be 1.9 million, but next year 2.2 million. How many people do you expect it to reach? I think there was a preliminary indication that it would be 1,600 people across all five boroughs. Mm -hmm. Just give me one minute. Is that still the expectation? So for respect and responsibility, we're anticipating that annually we'll serve um, approximately 1,200 participants in a multi-hour course, 225 participants in a multi-week course, and 450 clients through case management and counseling. We're Can you say that just a little bit louder and a little sure. bit more slowly? Thank sure. you. 1,200 in so a... So we're, we're anticipating that annually we'll serve t about 1,200 participants in a multi-hour course. Multi-hour course? over 200 participants in a multi-week course, and approximately 450 clients through case management and counseling, and that's for respect and responsibility. Will that meet the demand? Again, the, we are filling a knowledge gap that we currently have with participants outside of the criminal justice system, so during this demonstration project, we're both identifying the participants and the demand outside of the criminal justice system and testing this intervention. And then we'll, um, as we conduct the multi-year evaluation that will coincide with the demonstration project, we'll be able to then assess how this program and those deliverables meet the demand. How many years is the contract for? It'll be a three-year demonstration project. So it's only in the budget the in fiscal year, does it start fiscal year 20 or nine or 21? So we anticipate the program will come online in 21. The program is in development in 20. Mm -hmm. So next year we'll be spending 300,000. In 2021, we'll be spending 2.2 million. In 2022, 1.9. And in 2023, zero. No, so the um, annual operating costs are the 1.9, mm -hmm. um, which is for the three-year demonstration project. Um, the 300K is for development. Got it. Does the 1.9 stay in the budget into perpetuity? Is it baselined? Yeah. So the expectation in the budget, can you confirm that? Is yeah. that it will, the RFP will be reissued on an annual basis? We will always be spending 1.9 million? We will assess the success of the program at the end of the demonstration project and then explore additional solicitations for ongoing programming. So in 2023, fiscal year 2023, tell me if I have the years wrong, you'll be doing an assessment about whether or not to continue with the program, tweak, whatever, would you consider is part of the could part of the assessment be completed in 2021 or 2022 and could you start making tweaks or 
expanding immediately? So the evaluation will run the course of the demonstration project and will begin at the launch of the demonstration project mm -hmm. and we'll be assessing the results of the evaluation throughout the course of the three years. When's the first point of assessment? Um, I can look at the milestones, just give me one minute. Give me one minute um, to look at the milestones for the evaluation, um, or if you prefer, I'm happy to get back to you with that answer. I think it's important. It just feels like, given the number of people who come forward um, saying that they have been, uh, there's been violence perpetrated against them, the number of um, people that are being um, taken care of, you know, 450 in a very meaningful way um, seems small. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two methods, I don't understand how they're not different than what's being done now, if it's a multi-hour program or multi-week program. Um, all evidence points to those programs not having a meaningful effect. So I'm really just looking at the 450 who are going to get case management. Um, so the evaluation, as I said, will run the course of the demonstration project and will begin at the time that the program launches. Um, and we anticipate meaningful results as early as between months 9 and 20. Um, and that's when we'll start to look at the results of the evaluation that started to come in and be able to modify and tweak the program as needed during the evaluation, during the demonstration project. So by the end of the demonstration project, we'll have a solid foundation to be able to assess the success of the intervention in the program, but we'll be evaluating the results and already planning um, the next steps um, as the program is in development. Is there a reason that, is it because of the nature of the contracting process that you can't say month nine is February 2021? Yes, I can't anticipate yet because we have a solicitation open right now. I can't anticipate yet when a contract will begin. Do you have a sense of when it will begin? We're Let's assume everything works perfectly. When will it begin? It's hard to be able to commit to a start date when we have an open solicitation right now, but we're... Um, when does the open solicitation end? So, hold on. December 16th. December. And so then it goes through the contract process, which takes... Six months? So it will, go, it will go through a selection process, a vendor selection process, where we'll identify um, a vendor. And that takes? I can't commit to an exact timeline in terms of how long that would take, but we anticipate identifying a vendor shortly after the close of the solicitation. Okay. So, and then will it have to go through a few, uh, will you be able to start funding the program immediately, or will it then have to go through a year-long registration project? process? So the contract will have to be registered, but we anticipate beginning the program shortly after vendor identification, but we will be following procurement processes. So hypothetically, the, it could start in, I'm making this up, March or June of 2020, and the program would start, and also the registration project process would begin. We anticipate the program coming online in FY21. We will have um, more information by the end of this calendar year and can circle back with you then to talk more about the timeline for implementation. Okay, I wanna be able to hear from others who are here. Thank you so much for your time. Council member, do you have any additional questions? I Thank you very much. We've got some things we, we're gonna follow up with. You have some, uh, some homework to do, if you don't mind me describing it that way. And um, we're very much looking forward to this coming budget uh, conversation and negotiations where you know, hopefully the, um, the city's approach to the funded court ordered, court connected um, uh, programs uh, have the kind of metrics that we're looking for and, and are structured with current thinking towards what what works and what doesn't. Yes. yes. So, to be continued. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from the district attorney of uh, 
District Attorney's Office from uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan, and I think we have a representative from Staten Island, and I think we're inviting the Urban Resource Institute to come and testify alongside the uh, Manhattan District Attorney. So if you all would please uh, come to the, the, the witness table, we can, we can get started. Just make sure everybody has seats. All right, thank you for your patience. If you raise your right hand, we can get sworn in and proceed. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Terrific. Um, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, would you like to get started? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lanceman and the members of the Committee on the Justice System and Chairwoman Rosenthal and the members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for the opportunity to testify today regarding, regarding Batterer's intervention programs, also known as abusive partner intervention programs. Domestic violence, specifically intimate partner violence, accounts for a large percentage of 911 calls, NYPD arrests, and prosecutions in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Historically, the number of cases my office has handled in relationship to uh, family-based violence is approximately 10,000 um, each year, the vast majority of which are misdemeanor crimes. Domestic violence accounts for a large percentage of cases in the criminal justice system, but it's not just a criminal justice matter. It's a public health crisis. Despite this reality and despite the public's increasing awareness and empathy towards survivors, there's still, unfortunately, a significant uh, shortage of effective evidence-based programming and services that focus on prevention and intervention. It has been 25 years since the passage of the Federal Violence Against Women Act, but we still know very little about the root causes and cures of intimate partner violence. We need to invest money in research and effective evidence-based programming we also need programming that takes a holistic approach to the issues facing those who commit these crimes. While sending domestic uh, abusers to jail may protect survivors over short term, incarcerating offenders and hoping they won't reoffend when they're released has not proven itself an effective way to keep survivors safe over the long term. Quite frankly, we cannot prosecute and incarcerate our way out of this public health crisis. And our country has not made it a true priority to study the root causes of domestic abuse and how to prevent it. 
As with so many other pressing issues that needs our attention, there simply has not been adequate funding. In my office, we determine on a case-by-case -case basis whether to offer an individual charged with a domestic violence offense the ability to participate in one of these programs as part of a plea disposition. If offered a program, the defendant can choose between two providers, Power and Control, the PAC program, which requires participants to attend a one-hour session once a week for 24 weeks. Uh, they receive funding from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. The other program is run by Treatment Alternatives for Safer Communities, or as known as TASC, which requires participants to attend a two-hour session once a week for 16 weeks. TASC does not receive outside funding, um, but both of these programs are educational programs where the participants and the trainer discuss issues such as power and control dynamics, healthy and unhealthy relationships, effective communication skills, and conflict resolution. Both providers charge a fee to participate, but set rates on a sliding scale. The fee has been a significant barrier as many domestic violence offenders say they cannot afford the cost of the program. There is some scholarship money for those that cannot afford the fee, and there are a few programs available in the city that do not require payment. One of those programs requires the participants to have Medicaid. However, advocates are opposed to health insurance covering these programs because it would often require domestic violence offenders to obtain a mental health diagnosis, su such as intermittent explosive personality disorder, from one perspective, the act of domestic violence is a choice someone makes, and by turning it, in, it into a psychological diagnosis, we are removing accountability from the batterer. Requiring offenders to pay for the program is one way of making them take responsibility and accountable for their behavior. But as part of the recent wave of criminal justice reforms, that thinking has been criticized and challenged as unfair to those charged with crimes and to their family members. But the truth is, in Brooklyn, we send very few domestic violent offenders to these programs. Many don't agree to participate, whether for cost reasons or otherwise, and even those who do participate, there's currently very little evidence tracking whether or not these programs are actually effective. The Center for Court Innovation conducted studies in Brooklyn and, and the Bronx in the early 2000s. The Brooklyn study compared recidivism rates for participants sent to different types of batteries intervention programs, as they were called back then, one based on an educational model, the other using cognitive behavioral therapy. The Bronx study examined recidivism rates for those sent to a batterer's intervention program versus those cases just simply monitored by the court and a judge. In both studies, there was no significant difference in recidivism rates. Furthermore, determining the success of these programs is much more complicated than examining rearrest and recidivism rates. Many survivors do not call the police again if the defendant reoffends or the abuser could have moved on to a new relationship and a new partner, although abused may not reach out to law enforcement. Very few of these participants ever agree to speak to us about post-program behavior, particularly if they're continuing to abuse their partner. We would have to reach out to survivors and essentially poll them on whether the program worked, and this, to many, may re-traumatize survivors. CCI has recently developed a new abusive partner curriculum after conducting research on innovative programming in the United States, Canada, and England. CCI's new program appears to be a more responsive and comprehensive program for abusers that includes in its curriculum the following, risk and needs assessments, cognitive behavioral learning, trauma-informed practices, and procedural fairness. I'm hopeful that this new program uh, will be successful and looking forward to its implementation. I was pleased to hear about the First Lady's Interrupting Violence at Home Initiative for abusive partners who are not involved in the criminal justice system. 
And of course, appropriate interventions for those who harm is only one part of our obligation to safety plan for survivors of intimate partner violence. I would be remiss here today uh, to speak about domestic violence without also addressing the specific needs of survivors who come to my office seeking assistance to obtain justice, but also help getting back on their feet. Without adequate resources, survivors are often forced to stay in abusive relationships. And based on what we hear from survivors, their most critical needs include basic life necessities, such as food and clothing, as well as expenses related to moving, a moving van, first month's rent, new pots and pans and furniture. But also, many survivors also need assistance with child care. The lack of child care often forces a survivor to remain dependent on an abuser because it interferes with her ability to access service, services. We often hear from survivors that they can't come to the office to talk about their case because they have no one to watch their children or pick them up from school. Finally, survivors need assistance with housing. They struggle with the city's limited shelter beds and as we are all well aware, the lack of affordable housing in New York City. Combating this public health crisis of domestic violence by preventing abuse in the front end and supporting survivors in the back end must be one of the top safety priorities of, of this city. And I wanna thank the city council for your attention and commitment to these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Does it make sense to just go down the line? Sure. Good afternoon. It's an honor and a pleasure to appear before the New York City Council today. I want to thank the City Council's Committee on the Justice System and the Committee on Women and Gender Equality, uh, Equity, excuse me, for holding this hearing and inviting the Richmond County District Attorney's Office to share our thoughts and concerns about the efficacy and efficiency of abusive partner programs in our borough. Recognizing that domestic violence presents one of the clearest threats in the lives of many individuals and families on Staten Island, District Attorney McMahon has made combating this issue a priority for his office. He's taken numerous steps, such as building RCDA's first dedicated domestic violence bureau, helping to open Staten Island's Family Justice Center, and creating a separate domestic violence complaint room with, an ex with extended nighttime hours in order to build stronger cases while providing immediate support to victims. As a result, domestic violence arrests on Staten Island have declined by about 20%, and domestic violence dismissal rates have dropped by almost 50%. Despite our best efforts, though, serious crimes of domestic violence continue to con uh, occur here in Staten Island, with several high-profile cases garnering significant media attention over the past year. Just this weekend, for example, a man allegedly stabbed his wife, set their house on fire, and seriously injured himself during a chaotic scene that unfolded on Staten Island's North Shore Saturday evening. At the same time, the majority of homicides that we have seen throughout the borough have been domestic violence related, leaving prosecutors searching for answers as to how we can do more to prevent such tragedies from occurring in the future. In our office, abusive partner intervention programs are offered as a component of sentence as well as a mechanism to help individuals understand accountability and cultivate pathways to working through anger without violence. Additionally, these programs do offer an opportunity for participants to identify and address other underlying issues that may contribute to criminal behavior, such as substance abuse, mental health, or trauma, providing meaningful wraparound services that maintain uh, excuse me, that remain available following the completion of the program in, uh, in PAC's instance, anyhow. And while we believe that the better uh, intervention programs or abusive partner intervention programs can work to help change or improve uh, behavior, negative behavior, possibly preventing future crime of violence, there remains a serious lack of variety to accessible programs for our defendants on Staten Island. In fact, after years of never having a batterer's intervention program available at all in our borough, the city just last year contracted the PAC program uh, to fill that void. And while we are grateful 
uh, we have found that only having that one option available to hundreds of defendants limits the program's overall reach and effectiveness. There must be a wider and more flexible offering of local community-based programming available to defendants on Staten Island in order to promote greater outcomes. While we have made significant progress in combating domestic violence, greatly reducing the number of domestic violence arrests and lowering the dismissal rate, and offering a wider variety of victim services, more must be done to prevent offenders from escalating their crimes into further acts of violence. As we look for solutions, it is clear that Staten Island still lacks the necessary resources to address the root issues of a defendant's criminal behavior. Uh, abusive partner intervention programs can be and are a useful tool, tool to tackle this program, but only if a robust network of community-based programming exists to serve the individual needs of each defendant. Thank you. Thank you. and members of both committees. My name is Audrey Moore and I'm an Executive Assistant District Attorney and Chief of the Special Victims Bureau at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I'm joined by my colleague Maggie Walk who is the Chief of Strategic Planning and Policy. On behalf of District Attorney Vance, we thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Today's hearing is being convened at a time when incidents of domestic violence locally and nationally continue to increase even as rates of other types of crime have dropped. <laughs> Domestic violence, and intimate partner violence in particular, is a long-standing, ongoing problem that seems to resist traditional models of law enforcement. Millions of people are affected each year, costing society billions in health care, lost wages, and traumatized lives. In 2018, NYPD responded to over 13,000 domestic violence complaints in Manhattan. That is more than 35 incidents each day. The, prevail the prevalence of domestic violence is not just a criminal justice crisis. It is a national public health crisis that affects all neighborhoods and communities and threatens our most vulnerable family members, particularly women and children. One of the first steps DA Vance took when he was elected in 2010 was to create a special victims bureau to enhance the training, supervision, and coordination of resources applied to prosecution cases involving some of the city's most vulnerable victims. DA Vance was also a champion, key implementer, and partial funder of the Manhattan Family Justice Center when it opened in Manhattan in 2014. In 2014, our office likewise convened the Domestic Violence Initiative, a year-long series of working groups comprised of criminal justice stakeholders, public health officials, and community-based organizations that were brought together to develop recommendations to, permit, to prevent domestic violence and enhance responses across systems. One of the key recommendations from the working group members, which was later identified as a key recommendation of the city's domestic violence task force, was the creation of a trauma-informed abusive partner intervention program. In recent years, this has been a growing focus on the impact of trauma on individuals' well-being and the need to consider this pervasive public health issue in the delivery of behavioral health and other social services. Research suggests a link between the experience of childhood trauma and adversity and the, perpetu the perpetration of future domestic violence. We therefore set out to develop and implement an abusive partner intervention program that is trauma-informed and addresses the underlying behavior associated with abusive behavior. Unlike traditional methods that focus solely on issues of power and control, our goals were more expansive. In addition to holding the abusive partner accountable for their behavior, our new model aims to increase the likelihood that the abusive partner will gain insight into their behavior, develop empathy for survivors, accept responsibility for abusive behavior, respond to the intervention, and engage in meaningful and sustained behavior change. As part of DA Vance's criminal justice investment initiative, our office invested $1.475 million to pilot a trauma-informed APIP that offers a more holistic approach than traditional batter intervention programs. With the support of our technical assistant consultants at the CUNY Institute for State and Local Governance, our office released a request for proposals in November 2016 
soliciting a vendor to implement this model. A multidisciplinary disciplinary team of reviewers scored the responses to our RFP and selected the Urban Resource Institute, URI, to create and pilot the new program. URI has extensive experience providing client-centered services to domestic violence survivors and other vulnerable populations and has successfully operated programming for perpetrators of violence. Since there were no local examples that could serve as models, as this was the first time a truly trauma-informed APIP was being developed in New York City, we engaged URI in a 10-month planning process and sought the expertise of two leading experts in the field of abusive partner intervention and trauma, Chris Huffine and Carrie Mose. Mr. Huffine is the executive director of Alleys in Change, a Portland-based Portland based nonprofit that offers a wide range of counseling services and batterers intervention programs and is nationally recognized as a leader in the area. And Ms. Moles is the executive director of Court Appointed Special Advocates of New York City with over 25 years of experience in child welfare, domestic violence, and youth development. These national experts assisted URI in adopting a curriculum, developing policies and procedures that reduce re-traumatization and training staff on trauma-informed approaches. Over the course of the 26 session program, program, participants learn skills to actively evaluate their choices and develop accountability for their actions by discussing and reflecting upon learned behavior, life stresses, regulating emotions, family functions, and the impact of trauma. URI employs highly trained facilitators to deliver this curriculum in both English and Spanish on a rolling basis. Each session lasts approximately two hours. The newly developed cur curriculum teaches abusive partners to change the justifications, attitudes, and belief perpetuating their abuse. The program operates out of a newly designed space in central Harlem. Unlike other APIPs, URI offers a range of free voluntary services to participants, including case management, trauma-specific interventions, and refer referrals to address other needs, such as job readiness and housing support. Cases are screened by the resource coordinator in the domestic violence court part, as well as the leadership of the office's domestic violence unit. While we weigh victim input in our decision making, Program-based dispositions are ultimately case-specific and only offered after a careful review of an individual's criminal record, domestic violence and DIR history, and current violent behavior. Because the program is free, no individual is denied placement due to high costs or inability to pay. After referral is made, URI utilizes a series of screening and assessment tools to, compl to complete a risk assessment before accepting a potential participant into the program. Through this process, URI identifies an individual's needs, such as an immediate need for substance abuse treatment and level of access to resources, including medical insurance and providers, transportation, housing, overall health, employment, criminal justice supports, educational supports and services, paid support such as mental health providers and natural support such as family and friends. Understanding the long-term and short-term needs of abusers can help providers better address the underlying reasons for their abusive behavior. The first trauma-informed APIC group began on July 30, 2019. There have been 15 referrals to date and nine, and nine male-identified individuals have enrolled in the program. All nine are actively participating. Two additional individuals are pending a clinical assessment and or court approval, while four individuals were denied placement for such reasons as serious mental illness or, crimin or criminal history. During its first year of implementation, the APIP will serve 20 individuals total. During year two and three, the program will serve 40 individuals per year. The safety and survivors of children remain a top a priority of this initiative. Coordinated communication between URI and court stakeholders, as well as established protocols for reporting noncompliance, breaches in order of protection, and victim and child safety concerns ensure that noncompliance is addressed swiftly 
and law enforcement is informed immediately of risk to a survivor's well-being. The program connects survivors to a wide range of resources through both the Manhattan District Attorney Office's Witness Aid Service Unit and URI's Crime Victim Services. Survivors have immediate access to counseling, safety planning, legal service, referrals to shelters, advocacy for government entitlements, and workforce development programming. Survivors have agency to determine when, if, and to what extent they would like to remain in contact with the program. Finally, to test the, the efficacy of this model, we are funding a process and outcome evaluation. The Urban Institute, a nationally recognized research institution, has been selected as the evaluator, and we will have a preliminary report available in the summer of 2022. Final results will be available in January 2023. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and describe the process we underwent to develop and implement this innovative model. With continued support from our partners, we will continue to use all the levers available for us to address this public health crisis with the hope of creating approaches that lead to lasting change and reduction in intimate partner violence. Thank you. Good afternoon, council chairs and members of both committees. My name is Dr. Carla Smith, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Program Officer for the Urban Resource Institute. I'm joined by Luis Matos, our Senior Director of Community Education and Prevention Programs, and we are thankful for the opportunity to come before you and share our work with abusive partners, which we too see as a vital health and human services um, area. For those of you who are not aware, URI has been in operation for close to 40 years and is now the largest domestic violence shelter provider in the country. We currently offer close to 1,200 beds to victims of domestic violence on any given evening and will be increasing tier two capacity in the future. As you have heard, we have been and remain committed to developing and delivering innovative client-centered and trauma-informed services to victims of domestic violence and other vulnerable populations to include perpetrators of abuse. URI recognizes the need to serve underserved communities, including those who have been identified as perpetrators of abuse, and over the last three years in collaboration with both the Department of Probation in Westchester and more recently the Manhattan DA's office have responded to the call for, call for the operation and development of services in an effort to increase accountability and ultimately end domestic violence. For URI, that call consisted of a request for us to consider assuming operation at the time of an existing API program, APIP program in Westchester from a provider who no longer saw these services as core to their mission, and as indicated in the previous testimony, more recently URI responded to a call for providers to consider that the development of a pilot program that would endeavor to create a trauma-informed accountability program for perpetrators of abuse convicted of a DB offense in Manhattan. You've heard in the previous testimony how these programs came to fruition and that URI participated in a 10-month collaborative planning process that was designed to provide and result in the development of what is, a now, what is now a trauma-informed curriculum for abusive partners. That process included experts in the field that also included experienced URI staff who have been provided, providing APIP services in Westchester since 2012 which resulted from, uh, which resulted after a two-year planning process. The desire to pilot services in Manhattan grew out of this experience, which confirmed what you heard in the previous testimony, indicating that many perpetrators of abuse, of abuse have, been, have had previous experiences of trauma and may be predisposed to commit violent acts during the course of their lives. Specifically, we have found in our Westchester program that approximately 80% of the participants have experienced some form of violence in their lives. So far in Westchester, or so far in Manhattan, around 67% have reported childhood exposure to violence. Now, we do not see this as an excuse for behavior, but as a tool to inform the way we, in which we work um, in a trauma-informed manner to engage participants and de deconstruct unhealthy behaviors that have been learned over extended periods of time. The way in which these two programs operate and track information are different but our hope is to standardize the practice and outcome measures within each of these programs following the completion of a comprehensive evaluation on the impact of each modality. 
With respect to the Westchester program, it was, de it was developed in collaboration with a number of partners in the county to include the Department of Probation, which influenced the structure of the partnership and the length of mandated participation based on research of evidence-based practices at the time. The model is based on several behavioral interventions and concepts that take place in a 90-minute weekly group format over the course of 65 weeks. Participation is mandated and participants must pay a fee based on a sliding scale. It provides services both to male and female identified individuals. We have served approximately 240 individuals during the time of our tenure. Effective rates have, effective rates have been historically based on recidivism as it relates to DV reoffense and other non-DV related crimes were also tracked early on for those who remained in the county. Due to resource constraints, the program has had limited capacity until recently and will begin using a database that we designed for the new Manhattan program to track and record information and outcomes. The Department of Probation continues to demonstrate its commitment to the program and is seeking support from the Department of Criminal Justice to study and evaluate the program. As mentioned, the trauma-informed program in Manhattan was developed as stated following an analysis of URI's Westchester model and other best practices in the field. The program uses a model developed by Chris Huffine as its base with an enhanced trauma-informed lens and a variety of needs and accountability needs and accountability assessment tools added in. It operates with a two-hour group format over the course of 26 sessions. Participation is free, reducing income as a barrier to participation, and food is provided at each session for participants with limited access to resources. Groups are facilitated by trained facilitators whose role is to establish and maintain a favorable interchange and a mutual aid system. Hence, the facilitators trained on the curriculum begin the process to manage environmentally induced stressors uh, like job readiness, housing, need for housing support, case management, and interpersonally induced stressors, trauma-specific interventions. In a short time that the group has been running, our success has been in addressing these two challenges in order to create an adaptive balance among the group participants. The co-facilitators, male and female identified, have helped the participants to develop a sense of purpose and commonality about the impact of intimate partner, intimate partner violence. They share experiences and concerns. During the group process, safe and less threatening issues are raised first to test the facilitator's trauma-informed response and other participants' genuineness and competence. Through curriculum-focused assignments, the participants have become willing to risk sharing more sensitive and sometimes even taboo concerns. The trauma-informed process has, has taught the participants to share and relate to one another with all participants investing and engaging in the process of change. So what is different about this program? The program expands beyond the traditional models, including incorporation of some innovative components, which include the following. No fees charged, as stated, reducing barriers based on financial limitations. Ongoing access to wraparound services to address immediate daily living needs and reduce stressors. Eventual access to economic and, an economic empowerment center that is being established by URI and to open early in 2020. Short-term clinical support and access to long-term counseling through referrals. Incorporation of victim perspective on accountability through periodic engagement with victims who wish to do so. Um, and a periodic completion of an accountability assessment from the victim's perspective. Understanding victim perspective on accountability is key to understand whether or not a participant has changed their engagement in the use of a range of abusive tactics to include those not traditionally considered like pet abuse and incorporation of an accountability power and control will for uh, use in the program uh, with the participants. We also provide information and referrals to victims interested in receiving support that is client-centered and based on identified needs. We give participant access to continuing accountability support beyond the 26 sessions, recognizing that individual needs vary and that the length of time that support may be needed for some individuals to increase accountability may also vary. 
This service allows participants who have successfully completed the 26 sessions to engage in ongoing individual and group support with others who have done so and to influence others who may have completed the program after them. We, we are encouraged about the possibility of engagement in these services as thus far participants are also regularly wanting to stay beyond the two hour group for either group or one to one conversations. Part of this we believe is due to the program design, the experience and training of staff and facilitators and we are hopeful that this will enhance the desire to receive ongoing accountability services. These aftercare services also allow the program to re-engage as needed and to provide support to enhance and monitor accountability over time. We also have a peer model which provides opportunities for those who have completed the sessions to maintain maintained accountability and have been screened by the program to have an opportunity to serve as a paid peer facilitator after a period of time. This also, po also offers positive reinforcement for individuals who may not have received it otherwise. There is a focus on ongoing evaluation through use of both an internal and outside evaluator that you have heard about, engaging in process, docu in process documentation, and observational evaluation to determine program impact, efficacy conducted by the Urban Institute, as you heard, and URI's internally established quality improvement evaluation and training department. And while the program is currently providing services to male identified individuals, it is written for the most part in a gender neutral manner and is positioned to be modified in the future to accommodate individuals whose gender identity and sexual orientation differ from those currently participating in the program. We have also taken into consideration language proficiency and will be able to, in the future, provided funding is available, to make other modifications to the curriculum following evaluation to have material available in languages beyond English and Spanish. So what does, this, what does all of this mean, given that the program has just recently initiated operations? You've heard about the number of people currently enrolled in our targets for the program over the next three years. We have observed that participants are invested in the model and while it, is early, while it is early, we are encouraged by the engagement and in wraparound services and group conversations. Conversations about trauma history and impact have begun to take place, keeping accountability at the center. We are starting to see that there has been the acknowledgement of childhood traumas and similar life stressors and participants have begun to demonstrate that they are receptive to others' views and suggestions as to how these stressors have become maladaptive perceptions and abusive behaviors in their adult lives. Through proper use of curricular, curriculum assignments, the participants have begun to develop and practice new interpersonal processes and environmental activities and receive feedback from the group on their individual efforts. URI's trauma-informed group process has begun to create the potential through which participants act and gain control and mastery over self and their environment. Hence, the program assists the participants in acknowledging the, reena the reenacting of their behaviors in their intimate relationships. Once again, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you today and talk about the programs um, and we are uh, the, the, the APIP program. We remain committed to working with participants in these programs keeping accountability and victim safety at the core of all that we do. While there are no guarantees, we are hopeful that evaluation of this innovative model will result in positive outcomes that will also inform the field. I just thank you all so much for your work, your public service, um, and really appreciate all your thought and effort going into this. I, my only question really has to do with scale. Um, I'm trying to understand the difference between um, the amount of services that we provide, how many people are captured in that, compared to how many cases come in. So um, uh, DA Gonzalez, you mentioned that every year roughly, you have roughly 10,000 DV cases could you make a guesstimate of that, how many individuals that reflects? Well, 10,000 individual uh, offenders. Of separate, individual, yes. thank you. But uh, obviously, you know, tens of thousands of family members. Um, 
And then um, in Manhattan, the statistic was given by the number of incidents that NYPD responded to. Do you have a sense of, in the Manhattan DA's office, how many individual cases, individual offenders there might be? So in um, 2018, we had um, 6, 000, over 6,000 domestic violence related arraignments in Manhattan okay. Criminal Court. Great. And any idea from Staten Island? I don't have your testimony in front of me. Okay. So. Um, in Staten Island, we, uh, we've seen a, a decline over the last two or three years, but it is roughly 2,200 cases per year. So when the administration says that they're going to be able to help 450 people intensely, could one say that if we multiply the number of people that we could help by 100, we might be getting to the need in New York City? Right? I mean, if just doing mental math here, we've got 10,000 and then another 10,000 and then Queens say there's an, another 10,000, you know, we're in the Bronx, we're up to 40,000 individuals who need help. And what I heard the city say was that they're, they're doing something to help 450 people. You were gonna say something. It wasn't a question, I guess I'm making a statement, but is there anything anyone wants to add? To I mean, for, you know, for my thinking on intimate partner violence without the, you know, full evaluation of the, you know, whether or not these programs are actually making a difference, you know, while we have many thousands of cases, we are, um, we only put a very small percentage in programming currently. Um, I would estimate the number to be under 300. Um, there's some that uh, defendants choose not to do the programming when offered, um, but quite frankly, in a lot of cases with escalating violence, um, with histories of, you know, domestic incident reports and other, um, concerning behavior, uh, I'm not prepared to um, recommend that kind of dispositional outcome without you know, further studies in whether or not they're effective programming. And so um, that is a, a factor. Uh, in Brooklyn, we went many, many years in excess of a decade without ever putting a person into one of these types of programs and have really only more recently started to explore this. I mean, I don't mean to ignore other programs that perhaps exist that are not specifically batter intervention. I mean, there's also a need for substance abuse treatment and individuals do get, could I safely assume, they do get into those programs or mental health programs. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to start with something that um, you said, Mr. Gonzalez, which I think captures the, the, the essence of it all and, and why we're even having a hearing like this. He said, while sending domestic abusers to jail may protect survivors over the short term, incarcerating offenders and hoping that they won't reoffend when they're released has not been an effective way to keep survivors safe over the long term. And that's what we all want to achieve. I, <clears throat> have her, heard you say, maybe directly, maybe I'm reading in between the lines, not too much though, a real question about whether these programs are effective. And, and I think that was the best answer that you could come up with to the council members' uh, question, which I know put you all a little bit on the, on the spot. Why would we even think about expanding a program or programs until we know whether they, they work or not? And I'm sitting here saying, I, I don't know what works and what doesn't work. What's your impression as the, the district attorney of, of Kings County having to make these choices as to who's 
going into the program and who's not, and I'm sure you see people who've been through a program and now they're, they're back on the docket again. What's your impression of whether these programs, you, you have PAC and you have, you have TASC, I believe? Correct. Do they work? And, and insofar as they, they do or they don't, they could certainly be made better. What would you like to see as the city contemplates or, or goes through a new round, a new RFP, and potentially um, a new model for these kinds of programs and potentially expanded capacity? Right. Well, I think I listened to part of the prior testimony uh, from the uh, mayor's office, um, um, criminal justice, Mock J. And I think largely, Councilman, your questions about metrics were, was an important question and how do we define what success of these programs actually look like. Um, I don't believe, like in other diversion programs, that solely looking at recidivism, recidivism rates are going to be an effective measure. And I kind of detailed some of the reasons why in my testimony, because we actually don't know um, whether or not the person is reoffending, we only know if the person is maybe gets arrested again. Um, it doesn't speak to whether or not survivors feel that the program is providing safety to them. It doesn't speak to whether or not they're happy with the services, um, the outcomes of services. Uh, it doesn't speak to whether or not there's an escalation, a de-escalation in the home of violence. Um, so we really haven't explored what the root cause of, you know, analysis is on whether or not these programs work. And so in terms of me, in terms of my obligation to fight gender-based violence, um, before I uh, have my assistant district attorneys explain programming options and, and sort of lead them to believe that these in batter intervention programs, abusive partner, intervention programs are going to make a difference in their lives, I want to feel comfortable that's in fact happening. Now, there are cases that um, the uh, survivor of violence would like to see that um, tried, and so we try them, but it is, you know, it is sort of a difficult position for us to say to a survivor of this crime, this is what we'd like to do with the case, and we think it's going to be effective, and we stand by this, you know, procedural outcome um, of the case without having that kind of information. And um, in terms of compliance, we didn't even, I didn't hear any questions about compliance, but I don't think that we have a great record of compliance. People who are not doing well in the program are given multiple opportunities to continue in the program. There's not a lot of accountability for people who don't um, really meet the obligations in the most earnest of ways. They may get through it at the end, um, but like anything else, it's there's effective compliance and there's just people who get through the program. And so, you know, I have a lot of concerns. I, you know, the practices that appear to be de being developed in Manhattan sound great to me. And, you know, and I indicated that CCI has something that sounds promising. Um, but before, as district attorney, that I put my stamp of approval on these programs, I have to see outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, the Manhattan and, and, and URI uh, uh, folks, for a, a, a layperson, can you explain the difference between the URI approach and program and PAC, the PAC program? Well, uh, so if you're going to testify, just, I do need to swear you in. It's a he he um, raised his hand during the. Oh, you did. Yeah, it's Louis Matos who I your fingers mentioned. were not crossed. <laughs> raised them. He okay. oversees the program at the senior level. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, well, um, one of the prime differences is the fact that um, ten months planning process that we had with the district attorney's office, where we went, you know, step by step. Um, considering exactly the area where the program is going to be placed, um, how we're going to go about 
with the hiring process, the hiring process, uh, the um, diverse sensitivity or press um, sensitivity, and all these different factors that take place in designing the program. The fact that we had expert national experts come in who have been so. Sure. So I understand, and, and I res respect and appreciate the process that you went through to establish the program, and it seems really thoughtful and comprehensive right. and, and, and lengthy. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm an applicant, uh, I'm a participant in, in both programs. Mm -hmm. right? what, what is the difference in my experience as a participant in, in URI's program versus the PAC program? And I'm only, only kind of All picking right. on PAC because that's the what the city's is funding. That you probably won't pay a fee, right? Another difference is that the program is probably placed inside your community rather than in an area, rather than in a governmental building or something that's outside your community. Um, that we might have um, individuals that speak Spanish, which is something that we've taken into account. That, um, that the whole design of the actual environment you're going into it's responsive to probably some of your needs. That the times in the schedule where we're running groups is responsive to your schedule and your needs. I also saw in your testimony, mm -hmm. uh, one of your testimonies, that um, there's, uh, there's, there's other services available? Right, wraparound services. Could, could you describe that a little bit? Because we, we talk about that a lot in the context of funding for public defenders. Mm -hmm. And so they've got a, a client who's a defendant in a case, but he or she may also have an immigration problem, a housing problem, et cetera. Can you talk sure. about your wraparound services? Sure, so we have case management staff as well as a clinical um, uh, staff member. Um, when clients come in or participants come in, they, we do a comprehensive needs assessment. So we have an understanding of what their needs are related to housing, uh, benefits, medical issues, um, economic empowerment in terms of jobs, things of that nature. Um, and we go through that comprehensive assessment to determine what are those factors that may also contribute to or add stressors to their lives and impact their ability to really engage in the programming. And so our case manager will immediately begin to address any immediate needs. We also provide food. And we have found that people, when they're coming in to, for either an initial assessing, may, may not have eaten that day or may not have eaten before they come to a group. So we will provide some food um, to get people sort of not thinking about being hungry. Um, and we also have space designated within our, our office space, as Mr. Mato, Matos talked about, the office space has been designed to be trauma-informed. The way that it looks gives encouraging messages. Um, things that we have on the wall, color chosen, choosing, things of that nature. In addition, we have space designated, computer space designated for participants to use computers to do job searches, housing searches. We are an experienced uh, provider to victims of domestic violence and other individuals, and so we understand that there's a need to connect people to services um, immediate services in order for them to fully engage. So we try to address all of those things, and then we have partnerships with other organizations. So we understand we can't do it by ourselves. So we work collaboratively with the DA's office and other organizations to make referrals for people, and then follow up on those referrals with them to see if they've actually engaged. Are they experiencing any challenges? We provide transportation assistance, metro cards, so people can get to and from the office, to and from appointments that we may help them schedule so that it releases them from sort of thinking about all those things that might interfere with their ability to engage in the program. And then the clinical services, we do a mental health, full comprehensive mental health assessment, including a trauma history questionnaire, as well as a PTSD assessment if necessary, depending on what comes up in the trauma history, and determine whether or not we need to do, we will offer individual short-term uh, work with them and determine whether or not we need to do referrals for outside mental health support. If I may just add um, one aspect that I think is unique about the Manhattan model that was just described. While I can't speak to the specific aspects of the PAC program, 
Um, I can say that unlike other traditional abusive partner intervention programs, this model um, provides services in addition to the abusive partner to the victim as well. Um, so the survivor can access services through our office, through the Manhattan DA's office, um, and in addition, <coughs> URI um, has a mechanism for providing those services as well, clinical and wraparound. Does, does the Manhattan system. DA's office also use PAC? Uh, the Manhattan court system uses PAC, so that, that is yeah. something that we have used in the past, um, but our referral pipeline into abusive partner intervention programs currently is focused on the URI model. Uh, yes. Uh, just to add to the the incorporation of accountability assessments, we have developed two accountability assessment tools. One is self-report that we will check in periodically above and beyond sort of what we are observing and seeing in the group. But we thought it was important based on a study that was done, the Mirabelle study um, that was done, where engaging survivors who or victims who are interested in remaining in contact with the program would allow us to really understand the from the perspective of the victim, which we felt was important. We also understood that we needed to be mindful for those survivors who decided to complete that with us periodically. And it, it, it um, examines a variety of abusive tactics and levels of, of, of perception around do they, have, do they feel that they have freedom to do these things? A whole bunch of different things that fall under different categories of abuse in terms of type of abuse. But we, what we wanted to do was to make sure that whatever we gleaned from that, that when we went back to do the work in the group with the participants, we did so in a way that did not jeopardize survivor safety. So it's not about saying your partner said, it's around figuring out ways, and we do sort of case conferencing with the staff and the facilitators. How do we incorporate this issue that we're being advised about that the perpetrator or the participant is not really admitting into an exercise in this session so that it doesn't convey that the survivor has told us anything that may put their safety at risk, but so that we can build it into um, a curriculum that is flexible enough for us to change things within the modules. So we're hoping that having that victim input tells us the real deal, so to speak, um, when we know that per, uh, participants may, you know, modify information um, to get through the program. And so we have ways of sort of circling back on that. Just really quickly, um, you have so many great answers to these questions. It really sounds comprehensive. In either your program or in the PAC program, um, do you know if there's any um, specific uh, um, information or, or intervention that's given for the LGBTQAI population? Currently, we have not um, had referrals for individuals who identify in that way. However, the curriculum itself, as I mentioned, is, was set up to be um, as gender neutral as possible, understanding that we have access to resources and our agency is um, uh, continuing its efforts to be culturally competent working with that population. Um, and we are positioned to add modules in the event that individuals who identify as members of the LGBTQ community are coming in. So it might replace an existing module, or there may be a language tweak that we need to do. Um, we may use a different power and control with which we have access to. Um, so we're positioned for that. Right now, the individuals who have been referred to us are not identifying as members of that community. Thank you very much. All right, thank you all for your testimony and for the good work that you do. And um, we all definitely need to keep an eye on what Mach J is uh, gonna go through in terms of um, a new RFP. And uh, hopefully your views on that will be solicited. And if they are not, let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to hear testimony in is what might be our last panel for the day. Um, Brooklyn Defender Services, the New York City Anti-Violence Project, 
Are there any other public defender organizations or legal services organizations that are here um, waiting to testify? You're, you're looking at... No, 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 we'll get to that. I got you. That's it? Okay, good. Um, in, in that case, um, Professor M Mills from um, NYU. Right down, right down the street. Come on down, and this will be our last panel of the day. Yeah, uh, the Lipman Commission is here. Let's 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 bang it all out in one <laughs> blaze of glory. One final panel, blazing a glorious trail <laughs> of testimony across the New York City sky. No pressure. So if you can all raise your right hand so we can get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Good. Um, who would like to start us off? Your, 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 sure. I'll write the check. We'll do that. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Piali Basic, and I'm the supervising attorney in the integrated um, defense practice of Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, I thank the New York Committee on the Justice System and Women and Gender Equity and Chair Lansman and Chair Rosenthal for holding this important hearing and providing the opportunity to testify on the efficacy and efficiency of the city's batterers intervention programs. As an institutional provider in both criminal and family um, court in the child welfare cases, we still see a general over-reliance on batterers intervention programs. We represent thousands of people each year who are mandated, mandated by criminal or family court to complete these programs. While we believe that both the family and criminal courts over rely on batterers intervention programs in cases where there is an allegation of domestic violence, until alternative options are easily accessible, free, and recognized by the courts, these programs must remain available for clients. Now, I think everyone has noted that a one-size-fit-all approach is not meaningful. However, that is still the approach that is used both in family and criminal court. Um, and what we're finding is that these, as has as been mentioned, the batter's intervention programs are often cost prohibitive. Um, the intake is $50 for the initial in intake assessment. And yes, there is a sliding scale. Um, however, our clients are still forced to pay some amount um, for a course of up to 24 weeks um, to complete these programs. Um, these, as, as the council has noted, um, these, link, these programs are not offered in the languages that our clients speak, um, and they do not address the issues of intergenerational intergener trauma. In addition, I mean, they are located in very um, in locations that are not easily accessible for our clients, um, and at times that our clients are just unable to attend, as our, many of our clients are often excluded from the home, um, forced to find additional employment to pay for rent, both um, for their families and for themselves when they're excluded from the home, in addition to these programs. Um, however, these programs are currently necessary for our clients to resolve their cases and amend orders of protection um, to reunify with their families. Um, so BDS, um, we would like to see alternative programs and options available and more accessible to, um, to our clients. We encourage the city to invest in a wider range of programming for individuals that address not just domestic violence and intimate partner violence, but also include opportunities for family therapy and supportive programming for mental health and substance abuse issues where it is appropriate. We would like to see the batterers intervention programs, um, both batterers intervention programs, but also community-based support programs available for, again for free. I think that as um, has been noted previously that there are very few programs um, that are, are available for free. Um, I believe perhaps in Brooklyn, maybe one that uh, we are aware of. Otherwise, most of the programs do have a fee. Um, 
and we were asking, and we'd like to see more programs available in um, the designated languages. As we've noted that we've seen clients who have not been able to find programs in um, Bengali, in Urdu, in um, Uzbek, and because of that, they are separated from their families for weeks, and I have seen for years. Um, and, and it is to a huge detriment to these two families um, who are involved in the child welfare system. So we hope that in the future batterers intervention programs can be, can be meaningful um, and effectively reduce violence. But until that happens, we need additional tools, we need funding, and we need buy-in for programs that meet the needs of families. Um, and that are accepted by family and criminal court, I would like to note, that are accepted by the court system to resolve these cases. Hi, uh, my name is Audacia Ray. Uh, I use she, she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Community Organizing and Public Advocacy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Um, you have the long version of my testimony, but I'm gonna kind of pull out um, some of the, the main points of it. Um, so AVP is the only LGBTQ-specific victim services agency in New York City. Uh, we're the largest organization in the country that's dedicated to working with LGBTQ and HIV-affected survivors of violence and we focus particularly on survivors of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and hate violence, um, as well as hookup, pickup dating violence, stalking, and institutional and state violence. Um, we are a contractor with HRA as a citywide provider of non-residential domestic violence services for LGBTQ communities, and we're also the only LGBTQ-specific rape crisis center in New York State. All of our services are free. Um, I'm going to give two examples of some of the work that um, AVP has been doing um, around uh, batterer interventions. Um, we serve as chair of the coalition on working with abusive partners which, um, with NGBV. Um, they talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, and we co-convened the interagency working group on the New York City blueprint on working with abusive partners. Um, and that report is available through um, the Center for Court Innovation and on their website. Um, Chair Rosenthal also mentioned um, the pilot project Transform, um, which is a, a 16 or a 15 week facilitated group that is focused on accountability and healing for LGBTQ people who self identify as people who have committed harm through sexual violence or have the potential um, to do harm that way. Um, so also just to note that, um, you know, we do differentiate between sexual violence and intimate partner violence. Sexual violence often is a factor in intimate partner violence situations, but they are separate. Um, and while IPV is related to power and control and relationship dynamics, sexual violence can take place in a relationship and through hookups and, and other um, non-ongoing relationships. So that's uh, an important thing to note. Um, so Transform is um, the only program of its kind that we know of in New York, um, if not the whole country. Um, it's free of charge and it was focused on behavior changes for people participating in it. Um, and, that, and that involved lots of work around skill building with um, how to give and receive active, active consent and especially also managing triggers um, without resorting to, to harmful behavior. It was a small cohort, um, but 100% of the members completed the 15 week process with um, mandatory um, participation um, and um, all of them have actually recommended um, people to attend future sessions, um, which, is, which is really interesting because it's, it's showing that folks um, want this, this kind of programming um, and they think that other people can benefit from it um, as well. Um, it's, it's also important to note that um, this program, I think the success of the program is, is really based on the fact that it's fully voluntary, which is difficult when you're talking about um, people who, um, you know, someone has, has called the police or, you know, there's law enforcement involved um, and then you're getting into the territory of having a mandated um, program and this, this program is, is not mandated, it's fully um, voluntary. And so in, in the like SV and IPV field, we've been talking a lot about um, how effective can a program be if it's mandatory, but also like if someone doesn't want to participate in a program, um, they don't, they, you can't just have no consequence for that. Um, so, so how do you manage those things? And it's kind of a, a big unanswered question that we're, um, we're definitely wrestling with as, as we're doing this work. Um, but 
Um, we're very excited about being able to continue transform um, in the future. Right now, it's um, actually funded through FIPSA, which is the Family Violence Protection Services Act. Um, so, so that's so it has federal funding to it, but it'd be also great to be able to expand it. Um, we had a one-year pilot, and we're figuring out how to support it in the future. Um, I also wanted to highlight that, for partic particularly for LGBT people, um, people who cause harm to their partners are often also themselves survivors. So um, this, they're, the binary of survivor and person who causes harm is a false binary. And it's important for us to recognize and engage with that when we're providing services to people who've done harm to also recognize that they're also survivors and they're processing their own pain and experiences um, and reactions to violence. Um, there are also a, a couple of things that I wanted to, to point out, um, just some analysis. Um, right now, there are no LGBTQ-specific abusive partner intervention programs in New York State, um, and there are very few programs that will serve women who are identified as abusive partners. Um, and that's even true for when um, AVP, when we hear from our clients that um, they have nowhere to go for this programming, even when it's mandated. Um, so so that's, that's a big concern. Um, and also the, the fact that most abusive partner intervention is only available through a court mandate creates a particular challenge for LGBTQ people um, because for, for lots of different reasons. But one of the reasons is also because that a lot of the behavior that is counted as, as IPV isn't necessarily a crime. And um, every instance of, of, um, of IPV incidents aren't necessarily resulting in arrest and detention. So how do you support people who are not committing IPV-related crimes but are abusive partners um, when, they're, when the only way to get that access is through mandated programs, and mandated programs don't serve LGBTQ people anyway. Um, so the two things that we really want to recommend um, are that um, the council works to identify and release more funding for abusive partner intervention programming that's culturally responsive, inclusive, and affirming across the spectrum of gender identity and sexual orientation with specific programming that's designed to work with LGBTQ people. Um, and this must be available for people who are court mandated and also for people who wish to access these programs voluntarily. And there are also you know, complications with both those things. Um, we also want to ensure that the programs are trauma-informed and that they're free of charge. Um, we actually don't feel that um, the charge, you know, charging people for services um, makes them more committed to the process, and that actually, in many cases, um, economic instability is part of um, the factor that contributes to people um, becoming abusers in the first place. So that kind of economic sanction on them actually doesn't help, doesn't make them take it more seriously. Um, and the programs also need to focus on behavior change, not just um, education about like what happened to them and what they're doing, um, but they have to be focused on, on behavior change and be able to, to show that, that they're making strides in that way. Thank you. Professor. Thank you. I was told I had three minutes, so I'm not going to be very specific about the program that's being studied, but you have the research there attached to my testimony. It is an honor to appear before you today regarding the important question of the efficacy and efficiency. Just, of, just one second. Sure. I don't, I don't have your... I handed it to uh, someone. Oh, okay. It says testimony. Yeah. Now I got Very it. Very good. You. Excellent. Does everybody else have what they need? I was told to bring... Yes? Okay. Good. Let me start over. It is an honor <laughs> to appear before you today regarding the important question of the efficacy and efficiency of batter intervention programs, also known as BIPs. They've been referred to in many different ways today. My name is Professor Linda Mills from New York University. Yes, just up or down the street, depending on how you call New York City. For the past 20 years, my research focus has been on creating effective treatment programs for people who commit domestic violence or DV crimes with a focus on reducing violence and enhancing victim safety. This, I think, responds to many questions that were raised already today. My research partner with me, Dr. Brianna Barocas, and I have collaborated with judges, treatment providers, victim advocates, and community members in implementing and studying a comparison between batterers' treatment and restorative justice using randomized controlled design, designs, or the gold standard. 
Our research has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Justice, among others. For many years now, researchers have evaluated the effectiveness of batterers' intervention programs. In sum, the studies suggest that there is little evidence that BIPs are effective in reducing subsequent violence. Professor Gondolf's studies published in 04 and 07 suggest there may be evidence to the contrary, but this study is an outlier in a sea of very disappointing results. There are 2,500 BIPs in this country, and we continue to present them to those convicted of DV crimes as a treatment that will help them. We force people, as we've heard today, who often struggle to put food on their table to pay for these programs. It is a travesty for victims and all those affected that we do not focus more of our attention on identifying effective interventions. Today's hearing is a step. Clearly, all of you are committed to this, and I am very grateful to be here and share this information with you, so thank you. More recently, there are, in fact, many more promising outcomes in the research related to the reduction of violence over time. These studies suggest that when BIPs are combined with other treatment approaches, including acceptance and commitment therapy, cognitive behavioral treatment, and the case of our own research, restorative justice, they can, in fact, be more effective in reducing subsequent violence when compared to a typical BIP. In our study recently published in Nature Human Behavior, which you have in your hands, we compared two treatment modalities, a hybrid program that combined 12 weeks of BIP with six weeks of restorative justice treatment to 18 weeks of a pure BIP. We found astonishing results. There was a 53% reduction in new arrests for those enrolled in the hybrid BIP plus restorative justice program compared to the typical BIP. In addition, we saw a 52% reduction in the severity of crimes committed in the hybrid BIP plus restorative justice compared to those in BIP only. In this study, 42% of victims chose to participate in at least one restorative justice session. This evaluation took place in Utah where the state permits victims to join the treatment following the completion of a number of sessions by BIP, of BIP by the person who was convicted of the crime. I understand that the city of New York may be interested in experimenting with alternatives to BIP, which may include a victim who agrees to participate. This is laudable and important. Let me add that in a previous study published in the Journal of Experimental Criminology, we showed that there was no evidence that when victims participated in restorative justice treatment, that it put them at any more risk compared to BIP. NYU's Center on Violence and Recovery has been a pioneer in developing and studying restorative justice in the US now for over 20 years. We are currently seeking four jurisdictions for replication studies, which would compare BIP only, plus BIP and restorative justice. We would be delighted to include New York City in this important undertaking. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Tyler Nims, Executive Director of the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, most commonly known as the Littman Commission after our chairperson, Judge Jonathan Littman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I know that my remarks are the only thing standing between uh, people and their evening plans, so I'll keep them brief. I'm going to focus on uh, programming in the context of you, the you may not be familiar with council members evening plan <laughs> <laughs> so well, in that the, case. The, the community board will wait don't worry about it Go ahead. My, fe my fellow panelists <laughs> evening plans in that case um, I'll focus on pretrial diversion and, pr and programming in the context of bail reform and pretrial diversion uh, one of the core principles of our work is that New York City should use incarceration as sparingly as possible consistent with public safety the pretrial reform legislation that's going to take effect in January reflects this precept by making pretrial release the presumption in cases, criminal cases in New York, including domestic violence cases. Allegations of domestic violence pose special challenges and risks, and in some cases, pretrial supervision and diversion programs can help strike the right balance between those challenges and the mandate to limit pretrial incarceration. Uh, but I do want to note consistent with what the attorney from BDS said is that 
programs need not be the only option and that there are many people who are released today pretrial without programming. Uh, so first I'll go through some numbers. Last year there were approximately 200,000 criminal cases arraigned in New York City. Approximately 30,000 of those involved domestic violence allegations. Uh, the vast majority of these cases were misdemeanors, 85% uh, of them. 7% were classified as nonviolent felonies, and those are primarily criminal contempt, so people are accused of violating an order of protection. And then the remaining 8% classified as violent felonies, uh, including assault, strangulation, burglary, and, and robbery. Um, although these cases involve special considerations, their pretrial release rates are parallel to those of cases that do not involve domestic violence. So, 76% of people accused of domestic violence allegations or cases involving those allegations are released on recognizance. Fewer than 1% were remanded and the rest, about 24%, had bail set. And it's important to note that many people who have bail set are eventually able to make bail, most of them, and are not detained through the pendency of the case. Uh, also, very important to note that the racial disparities that are present across our justice system uh, exist um, in domestic violence cases and that people of color who are accused of charges including domestic violence uh, are significantly more likely to have bail set uh, than white people facing similar charges. So what this means for city jails, uh, as of about a month ago on October 16th, there are about 470 people incarcerated in city jails on domestic violence allegations. Uh, I can give you that breakdown, it's in the testimony, but uh, when bail reform takes effect in January, uh, as you know, many or some domestic violence cases are no longer going to be eligible for pretrial incarceration, incarceration at arraignment, so no bail, no remand. Um, other charges will come with a presumption of release uh, and a requirement that the least restrictive conditions be imposed, even though bail and detention are permissible. And we estimate that if the pretrial reform legislation had been in place on October 16th, approximately 100 of the people that are detained then would have been subject to release. And again, because many people who are held, or because people who are held in pretrial detention for misdemeanors average about 15 days in jail, many if not most of those people would have made bail or otherwise been released regardless of that pretrial legislation. There's reason to believe that some of the people who are incarcerated today could be on domestic violation, vi domestic violence allegations could be released pretrial with or without conditions. Um, according to a CCI analysis from last year, a significant fraction of the people who are detained pretrial pose only a low or low to moderate risk of rearrest or of domestic violence rearrest. I think they, they calculated 27% of the people who are incarcerated had that lower risk level. Um, so with that in mind, we recommend replacing incarceration in appropriate cases with evidence-informed alternatives that can hold people accountable, but also promote rehabilitation. Um, and these programs can be maybe more effective than incarceration uh, because while jails can offer a temporary reprieve from violence and from the burdens that are being created in the community, they rarely, incarceration rarely addresses the problems and circumstances that are driving violent behavior. Um, and I think D.A. Gonzalez said it very well, um, we're not gonna incarcerate ourselves out of our problems with domestic violence. So in addition to, to those programs, with the implementation of the pretrial legislation uh, in January, we recommend that judges be given the discretion to allow uh, people charged with domestic violence offenses to participate in supervised release. Um, we suggest a specialized supervised release track be developed that emphasizes compliance with orders of protection and offers programming, including cognitive behavioral therapy or restorative justice principles um, to try to get at those causes of domestic violence. Um, so just to sum that all up, um, allowing some people to be released and engaged in programs that are tailored towards addressing domestic violence can be more beneficial to victims, more productive to charged persons than sending them to jail. Uh, as you'd heard from everybody today, there's uh, much more that can and should be done to create these types of programs uh, and make sure that they're effective. And we encourage the administration and the council uh, to develop those programs and to seek alternatives where possible. Thank you. All right. Um, so, uh, Professor, where have you been all my hearing? I know. I'm sorry. I want. I was like trying to get your attention. 
Um, I, I hope you don't uh, uh, object, uh, colleague, but, but earlier on in the hearing, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal uh, leaned over to me and said, isn't there some professor somewhere, maybe at, at, at CUNY or John Jay or somewhere, I was here. Who, who's researched this stuff and, and, and can, can tell us, at least from the academic perspective, the research perspective, what works and what, what, what doesn't work. Um, let me, specifically regarding your testimony, it sounds like the, the, the current um, batter intervention programs are not effective, but what is effective is maybe a couple of things, but in particular you focus on restorative justice, that there was a study that compared a hybrid between a traditional batter intervention program and uh, restorative justice model versus a pure batter intervention program and, and the hybrid one, overwhelmingly. Um, so I just want to understand, and I, and I, I don't know if I'm being too uh, Talmudic, <coughs> but, but wouldn't a restorative justice uh, model and, and maybe some of the other elements, if, if that was put together, that, that would be a batter intervention program, it just would be one that incorporated elements that worked versus elements that, 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 that didn't. And I need to understand that because, especially as, as Mock J is gonna, gonna put out a new RFP and we're gonna go through the budget process and we've gotta decide what to advocate for or against, I don't wanna use the wrong terms. I don't wanna say our batter intervention program should incorporate restorative justice techniques and these other techniques um, and, and I'm, I'm not gonna sound like I'm making any sense because the two are mutually exclusive. So can you just explain that for someone like a lay person? Sure, they are not mutually exclusive and this is kind of where we landed. So we did a pure study of a comparison between restorative justice and domestic violence in Arizona several years ago. And we didn't find the kind of dramatic results that we got when we combined the two programs. This was very exciting because as you could see from today's testimony, there are lots of people attached to a batter's intervention approach. So we wanted to ask the very serious question, given that 2,500 programs follow the Duluth model, and that's what the research suggests, in one form or another. And we started to look at other research that used trauma-informed, whether it's ACT, ACTV, there are many versions of this, that the truth is, or CBT, the truth is they are all kind of a mashup of trying to get to the learned behaviors and helping people unlearn those behaviors and create an environment in the case of restorative justice or ACTV, you know, a model where people can be heard and felt in terms of their own histories of victimization to get to a place where, in essence, they acknowledge the ways in which they may be acting out in abusive ways and perhaps linking that to their own histories of abuse. But that can't happen in a traditional batter's intervention program. Period, end of story. All the research shows that. Literally hundreds of programs. We heard the DA talk about it. I mean, it just, it, it's not possible. So now the question is, how do we combine the best of all elements? And this was why we were so encouraged by the results. Let me stop there and see if that's addressing your question. Uh, it, it, it does, so let's, let's move. To the, to, in my mind, what is the next step? Or, or wait, before we even get to the next step. So let's just be clear. PAC, the PAC program, URI, what is your cold-hearted, ruthlessly academic evaluation of those programs? Because well, URI sounded really impressive, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, so while we were sitting here, I actually looked online, because we were here for a very long time listening to people, and um, the U, which was great and very informative and very important, <laughs> um, that the, for example, the trauma-informed program, the research shows that it may be effective in a domestic violence case, maybe. Our research is the gold standard and suggests, in fact, that given those conditions, it is effective. It's, in fact, effective. And so, you know, wh how you replicate that and in that particular jurisdiction, that's one of the reasons why Brooklyn decided not to send any cases, because there was a Brooklyn study that showed that batter's intervention programs were less effective. So all that is to say, it all depends, but the bottom line is 
that people have moved away from strict batter's intervention program and ask the question, what elements of that program are still useful? And that's essentially what we created in Utah. And let me go one step further, because I think this addresses your larger question. We didn't just attach a batterer's intervention program, excuse me, we didn't just attach a restorative justice program. The ideal is that you infuse from the beginning, and we also have a qualitative study unfolding, so there's more data to be had here. It's not just based on recidivism. But all that is to say, we, you need to adapt the batter's intervention program to have elements of restorative justice to respond to many of the cultural concerns that were raised appropriately in all of your questions. And so you can start to adapt what is working with Batterer's Intervention Program, which is helping people become aware of the ways in which their behavior may be abusive and where it may tie back to. And you can do that in a more restorative or trauma-informed way that is more sensitive so that people feel as though as they go through each one of these days of treatment that they're making progress. It's not just being you know, shouted at them and I'll stop. Go ahead. Follow up on that real quickly. I understand what you're saying, but the twist in, in your findings seems to be the element of restorative justice, yes. which is critical. Yes. Did you, in, in your quick look at um, the URI yeah. program yeah. or um, you know the RFP that the city has put out, is there that element of restorative justice in those programs? So I didn't look at the RFP. I'm more than happy to go back and look and do a kind of analysis of that. Restorative justice, for the most part, but Brianna should address this, might be able to address this, has not been incorporated in any um, direct way in any city programs that we have seen. I, I know there's a little bit of a program going, you know, a sort of effort to understand how it might be used, but I don't think in any intentional way that is therefore studied and understood as effective or not. So when um, the Office to End Domestic Violence, NGBB, Gender Based Violence, testified, they said that in 2015, 2015, they had a, a huge round table with everyone at the table. Yeah. Were you at the table? So we were trying to remember. We don't think so. Um, we have been a part. It's, it's a pretty shocking um, you know, thing to say. Um, we have been a part of co-op, C-O-W-A-P. Yes. And at times, um, Brianna attends more often than I do. Brianna's often invited more often than I am. Um, you know, if you want to I mean, I'm more than happy to try and untangle this. I've been doing this work for 20 years, and as you know, your own questions have been um, appropriately um, uh, um, forceful in asking the really hard questions. For 20 years, I have been trying to ask the really hard questions. I've ra raised questions about LGBTQA uh, communities. I have raised questions about the African American community and the impact of criminalization on the African American community. And the truth is that people found it quite threatening. It's one of the reasons why I moved to restorative justice to ask the question, how can I be productive in the field and contribute in significant ways a new model around the theory that I thought was right, which is that we had it wrong. And I hear you. Why did you do the study in Utah mm. or Arizona and not here? Because we weren't asked to. I think everybody knew this work was happening. Everyone, I mean, we did a study in Arizona many years ago now. People knew that work, and nobody asked us to come forward to work with them to create a restorative justice response in New York City. We would have been much more willing to actually stay home than to fly to Utah, which, you know, we came, came to be a second home for us in, in Arizona and as well. I've done that. Um, and 
Uh, and then just specifically about your study, what time period? What I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it very quickly. It looks very academic. It's, yeah, you know, it's the gold standard. Years. It's the gold standard, and it's <laughs> two an Two years of yeah. analysis after the work Correct. to identify Correct. recidivism or yeah. whatever. Yeah, and so let me... what let, years were yeah. the, was this time It was period? 2013 to 2016 or so, right? Right. Well, uh, they were in the randomly ass random assignment was 2012 uh, to 2014. Right. I just wanted to get a sense. Looking for two-year outcome data. Right. So it's in the teens already. Um, and then real quickly, I wanted to ask, I mean, because the results are astounding, but and you a little bit alluded to this at the when Councilmember Lanceman was asking you questions, 53% reduction in new arrests and 52% reduction in severity of crimes, all extraordinary. What are the other measures of success yeah. that you are researching? Yeah, so let me say two things that I think might be relevant and important to this. One is the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Justice fund the you know, one to five percent of the proposals that come in. So I want to give you a sense of the staggering competitive nature to actually be funded by a federal agency, okay, just to start with, because I think it gives you the, the larger um, context. Um, your other question was, sorry. Other measures of success. Yeah, so NIJ funded us to look at qualitative measures of success. What was the victim's experience of participating? What was the person who was arrested for domestic violence, what was their sense of participation? And those results feel as important and convincing as much of the conversation we've had here. So people felt more engaged, people felt more supported, people felt as though going through the process meant that there was the potential for that kind of transformative change. And can I ask um, the es experts who are at the table from New York, is, are there elements of restorative justice in the trans program that you just um, had, were there elements of restorative justice in there? Sorry to put you on the... Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so the TRANSFORM program doesn't um, facilitate meetings between um, the person who's done harm okay. and the person they've done harm to. Okay. Um, so that we haven't done that aspect of it. Um, one of the things that, that I've been hearing a lot about the about restorative justice programming in New York is that um, lots of, lots of um, RJ programs won't touch DV, um, and lots of which programs? Uh, the restorative RJ. justice, yeah, the RJ. The, the, well, lots of the restorative justice yeah, programs just, don't want to deal with domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Um, so it's it's great to hear that there has been some some success with that. So so there is a lot of discussion about about those kind of programming, but it it hasn't um, really developed in that in that space yet. Um, but but there is some some work happening around that. Um, can I just ask? I know there's a lot of uh, that people are watching online, but is there any? Are, may I ask? Are you from the administration? Or oh, thank you very much. So no one from City Hall is here, but NGBV is in the room. Yes. Is that accurate? Okay. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for staying. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. That's right. Um, is transform ever uh, used as a court, uh, court, court connected to a, a court case, like court ordered, court, court assigned, court offered? We have not done that. It's, so it's, it's, it's been a pilot. We've done it once. We've done a one 15-week cycle, um, and it was created with the intention of, of serving people who self-identified as people who have done harm, who have the potential to do harm. So I think that in the future we would also not connect it to a court process, but, um, and now that we've done one cycle and folks are now referring other people they know to it, I think it will grow. But um, it was definitely very challenging to establish the first cohort because <laughs> that, that act of self-identifying as a person who has done harm is, is very challenging for people to do. Um, and 
and even like in, in within AVP trying to figure out like where we were going to hold it because folks had lots of feelings about hosting a program for people who have done harm when we are a victim services agency. And so it's really opened up a lot of conversations about how in order to do this work to support survivors, we really need to develop these robust programs that, that talk, to, talk to and work with people who've done harm. Yeah. Uh, do you have any objection in principle to, to transform also being made available as a court ordered program? Um, Potentially, yeah. I, I, I don't know that, that that would work for us. I think um, the yeah the fact that it's it's 100% um, completion rate and that folks want more of it is is based on it not being seen as punishment and it being seen as something that folks can opt into. And and also we can if if we can create programs that are optional in that way, they can exist for folks who have not yet committed a crime. Um, and, and that also is important as a, as a prevention strategy. All right, well, well, let me ask you this then, as, as, a, as a representative of the Anti-Violence Project, what, do you have anything to um, say about the uh, suitability or efficacy of the programs that are court ordered, like PAC or, or TASC or, or whatever else is out there um, for the LGBTQ uh, Defendant? Um, I mean, we, we've had um, cisgender male clients who've participated in some of those programs and, and have, have found them helpful, although the structure generally is very heteronormative, so they, they talk along very gendered lines, and so folks find that the, the general strategies are helpful, but because it's talking about um, male abusers and, and female victims, that that, that dynamic is, doesn't speak to them, but um, also, for um, female um, f folks who are, have Id been identified and have been um, charged with, with a crime of, of DV, those folks are, are like not accepted into even mandated programs at all. So they're not even having the experience of being able to go through the program um, because the programs don't make space for them. Um, and, and that's a, a real problem generally, but also like if the programs are mandated, they should also be able to accept people and um, and furthermore, uh, you know, under um, the 2013 reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, um, that is the, the first major federal piece of legislation to be explicitly inclusive of LGBTQ people. And so under that act, um, LGBTQ people must have access to these spaces and they don't. Okay. So my last uh, question is um, in your capacity as, in, in AVP's capacity as chair of COWAP. Um, are, are you, have you been invited to uh, dialogue with Mock J and, and give input into what should be in this this next RFP? What should come after the the um, PAC contract ends in in June? I know we've been talking with the folks at NGBV. Um, I'm in the policy department, not in the direct services department, so I'm not sure what the direct services folks conversations have been having. But we have been talking to NGBV but not Mach J? I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Could you find out? Cause, sure. Because one of the things I think one of the takeaways yeah. yeah. from this hearing is, is our earning, uh, urging mm -hmm. uh, and insisting that, that Mach J solicit input from all of the fine people who've testified today and, and their organizations, et cetera, and including our, our public defenders who you know, are there to represent mm -hmm. the interests and needs of the individuals who are being put into these, these programs. So that's all I've got. Yes. One last quick question um, for you, Professor Mills. Your study, just to the council member's point about mandatory versus voluntary, um, it looks like, if I'm reading this right, your evaluation was in Utah where the state permits victims to join the treatment after completion of a number of sessions of BIP by the person who was convicted of the crime. So in other words, these are people who are convicted, were court ordered to do some BIP, and then chose to be participants. 
the first part was right. Uh, it's a randomized controlled design, so you are uh, assigned based on um, a lottery in essence. And so um, you didn't choose to participate in a restorative justice. That's what makes it the gold standard. Um, and so 200, and, let, me, let me try and explain, 250 or so people came into six judges' courts in Utah and all the judges, for the most part, assign uh, people convicted of domestic violence crimes to treatment in Utah. In and other words, so all of them were mandatory. All of them were mandated, Order. and they came to the treatment center, and the treatment center, in a randomized way, assigned yeah. you to one or the yeah. other. Okay. So this is a successful mandated program. Correct. And is there any significance to the words uh, the state it, yeah. is there any significance to Utah is it a state yeah. no right so let me tell you what the significance of Arizona and Utah are because I think that's relevant because we were researchers and because we were looking to test uh, using a gold standard we wanted to partner with judges and the criminal justice system who were willing. Got it. And in Arizona and Utah, we found that willingness. We do not need to partner with judges, but in its early stages, it was very important in terms of elevating the significance of the work to partner with the criminal justice system. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you all so much for your time waiting till the end of the day. I really appreciate your staying through the whole thing. I hope, uh, the city is listening to this administ to this panel. Um, you're all doing such ex excellent work. I feel less disheartened. <laughs> Still disheartened. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more um, person who'd like to testify today. Um, uh, Grace Price from the Close Rosie's campaign. Welcome. Good evening, Councilwoman, Councilman. Thank you for allowing me and uh, Frank to be the caboose in the hearing today. I will, as always, email my testimony this afternoon. Um, of course, there are um, all kinds of things that I was hoping this hearing would be about today because there's all kinds of um, <clears throat> issues in the woodwork with women, jails, and the criminal justice reform process currently hanging like a black cloud looming over the city. Without battering a ram against this hearing uh, and asking you, reminding you that the jail plan is a miasma of Title IX inequity <laughs> that no one has addressed, I want to move specifically on to the mayor's office to combat gender-based violence and talk about the funding issues uh, and how they relate to the DAs. And I also want to reaffirm uh, and ask again for the council to start thinking about moving away from the NYPD all interactions with survivors. The special victims units need to be completely divorced from the NYPD and the district attorney's office. We need a completely new unit to investigate all of these crimes in city agencies, in our jails, and in the community at large. First, I want to address um, what I heard Ms. Pennington say about the budgetary um, accommodations for the BIP programs over the, the coming years. Uh, and I want to remind you that our district attorney, Cyrus Vance, here in Manhattan, has this behemoth pile of money from the Criminal Justice Initiative that he chooses to dole out whichever way he chooses. Uh, very little of this money has actually come to survivors in New York State. A lot of this end the backlog, rape kit, nonsense uh, rhetoric that we hear from Mariska and from Joyful Hart and from the district attorney's office is about that money being spread across the nation to other jurisdictions. That is money that should have gone into the um, Crime Victims Fund here in New York. It should have been distributed to be used locally here in our communities. And it's outrageous that it's being spread across the country to build Cyrus Francis' national profile. Um, you know where I'm going with that, but I'll, I'll, I'll cut myself short. I'm learning to, to leash myself. Um, <clears throat> I also want to remind you that Cy Vance has just, as of October, posted seven new jobs for a community engagement unit that his office is creating, 
which will add over the next 25 years approximately $75 million to the budget. The Community Engagement Unit, if you look, um, and I've emailed all of the council members about this new unit that is being created, is fulfilling the jobs of the NYPD and of Cy Vance's campaign staff, and he's creating this unit precisely at the, the time where he's run out of money for his campaign. Overall, the costs of this new community engagement unit, and I've sent you the job descriptions that have been posted, will add per year over $2 million to the budget. That's $2 million that could be used for BIP programs. I'll move on from that, but it's egregious that this particular pile of money does not have city oversight, that it is not going through the general fund, and that you have no say, and the community has no say on where these monies are going. Ms. Price? Yes, sir. Can I just ask you, have you have any experience with, with one of these BIP programs? So, and of course, my own experience is where I wanted to end uh, my quick uh, 30 seconds left of my testimony. I wanted to talk about the number of batterers that are not even being identified as they process through the system. The mayor's office to end gender-based violence themselves have disclosed that last year there are only 65,000 appointments in all five family justice centers throughout the city of New York. That's 65,000 appointments overall. That's for rape, sex trafficking, pimping, domestic violence, abuse, all of these. Be uh, people are not being reached. So if the survivors of, of sexual assault and domestic violence are not even being reached, you can be assured that their, their batterers are not being identified and they're not being reached. My batterer right now still is sitting on 120th Street running a gang called the CBT that can't be touched. And all the little boys in that community that go to the PAL, the Police Athletic League headquarters on 119th Street that's literally a block away, know me by name, and when I go back into the neighborhood, they just shake their heads and they say, it is what it is. These are people that are being raised in Tony Southwest Harlem along the glittering restaurant row of Frederick Douglass south of 120th Street. They're being raised uh, in a community that says it's okay to abuse. Yeah, go to PAL and get your, your money for your after school program, but know that you can throw a woman through a fish tank causing her to need over 80 stitches in her genitalia and never be held accountable for it. I think that's a really good place to end. The problem here is not resources. The problem here is that people are not being identified as batterers. The district attorney's offices are letting people go. If you want to hear my solution quickly, the Clayton hearing. I keep pushing for Clayton hearings whenever we have these sort of domestic violence cross complaints that throw us in Rikers Island, uh, that don't identify us as survivors. At that Clayton hearing, you can enforce these programs. That's the, that's the moment. But we have to unpack what's happening in the DA's offices when they don't label the abusers as abusers and they let them go for whatever reason. That's the source of the issue. Thank you. I'm tired of the sound of my voice. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming today. And I think that concludes our hearing. Um, since I banged the gavel to open the hearing, perhaps you would like to, to bang it to close it. Well done. <laughs>